All right, thank you everyone. Um, uh, you're still sworn. I hope you all had a nice little lunch break. Um, I understand you're transitioning uh, data and analytics arm to UVM. Uh, what UVM entity is receiving that data? So this is Sarah Berry. We have a contract with the University of Vermont Health Network. The specific entity underneath managing the data is called the Data Management Office. And how did UVM uh, win the bid to take that work from OneCare? Uh, there was a strategic planning process initiated by our board that Vicki Lonarez described earlier in the day. And from that, there was a strategy to look for efficiencies and cost savings, as well as to advance our analytics overall. Through that process, the UVM Health Network was also looking to build out its uh, performance under value-based care contracts. And uh, we saw an opportunity to look at um, joining them in the process that they were running to look at different vendors. So it was really through that process. Was there a bid process? Uh, they had an RFP process. They would have to speak to it directly in more detail. One care staff participated in uh, seeing different vendor solutions, in setting specifications about what we would need to meet our current expectations of our network, uh, and then it moved forward from there. You said they had an RFP process. Who's they? The UVM Health Network. But it's the data that One Care possesses and is responsible for. Did you have an RFP process to select potent from potential vendors? No, there's two things happening at the same time uh, back when this was all occurring. So coming out of the strategic planning process, One Care found a need to look for alternatives. UVM Health Network independently was going to have its own process. We saw opportunities for synergy in that and explored whether the needs that we had as a network overlapped or aligned with their needs. From that, those criteria were provided out to selected vendors and there was an RFP process. We then were able to watch demonstrations and to indicate where we thought that the, um, the solution, the vendor, could best meet the needs for OneCare's network. The vendor being UVM. No, the vendor being a company called Arcadia. All right, how many entities did OneCare consider in providing this data to? Uh, OneCare considered all of the entities that the UVM Health Network was looking at for a vendor, but the vendor- oh, Hang on, let me interrupt, hang on. I'm getting at, did you consider anyone other than UVM? Did you, OneCare, when you're giving out your data, consider anyone other than UVM? No, we did not. We did not see a need. Why not? Because there were two strategies involved here. Ultimately, there's a new data platform that is a vendor. There is also the question that you asked me a moment ago about where, which entity under the UVM Health Network, that is the data management office, will be managing the data. Those two things came together for us in an overall strategy to meet the requirements of our board. But how could you evaluate whether or not UVM should take Vermonter's personal health information as opposed to anyone else if you didn't consider it other options? I, I think there's some confusion. It's not UVM. It is Arcadia that is the vendor. I understand the vendor, but you're doing this work with UVM, right? U UVM Health Network is our sole parent organization. As part of our strategic planning process, our board directed us to look for options to advance our analytics that would not be duplicative and would not be more expensive than so current not? offerings. Yeah, all right. Us doing this alone would cost Vermonters more money and we would have dueling data analytics with our largest healthcare provider and our sole member organization. That's not cost effective. And you have about 300,000 attributed lives, is that right? Correct, and, just a little yes, less. That's correct. And prior to this transition, 
did UVM Health Network have the PHI of those 300,000 people? Or were there some they did and some they didn't? Um, you, UVM Health Network or UVM MC has a existing arrangement with One Care Vermont that's been there since our inception where they provide supports and services as you know, Vicki described earlier in terms of employment point, et cetera. Through that, we've always received IT support and had appropriate protections in place. This effort that we're moving forward with advances that work because OneCare currently has a separate data vendor for a data platform. That platform will now be aligned through this agreement with the health network. OneCare still owns the data and is still responsible for the data as the accountable care organization. We still have all the business associate agreements in place with all of the payers. So if there is ever any um, breaches of data, ineffective use of the data, one care is ultimately responsible for that use. Thereby, we need to hold agreements with UVM Health Network to make sure that data is adequately protected. And UVM didn't have all of this data before this change, is that right? Sarah, I'm going to put that over to you. Um, we use servers through the UVM Medical Center slash Health Network. That does not mean that they had the type of access that would be um, envisioned in this new arrangement as staff are moving over in that direction. So previously, this data, OneCare used UVM services to house the data, but there's limitations, and now those limitations are altered through this arrangement. Is that fair? That is correct. Okay. And is UVM operating as a covered entity or a BA in this arrangement? I can check and get you that answer. I can't answer it off the top of my head. Um, did one care provide notice and receive authorization from the 300,000 Vermonters whose PHI was provided to UVM? We, we annually have to um, do data opt-in and opt-out processes on new members. So that's part of the ACO requirements. There's not a requirement for us to, once we transition vendors, to get reauthorization for that, as long as we have all the appropriate safeguards in place. So, you know, there's a safeguards rule, a privacy rule, and I'm trying to understand that what was the mechanism through which this information could be shared with UVM. So under the privacy rule, you have opt-in authorizations being provided. People say you can share this information with UVM for these purposes. And then there are certain permitted uses. And what I'm trying to understand is what was the legal authority to provide uh, you, OneCare, the right to give this information to UVM? So, uh, Chair Foster, my understanding is that everything that we are doing is under the allowance for payment and operations under HIPAA. And in this case, what we're talking about is UVM Health Network acting as a subcontractor, a vendor of OneCare for the purpose of those payment and operations. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Barry. That's helpful. And what did OneCare do to ensure that that permitted use, the healthcare operations use, is the only use by which UVM uh, has access to? Thank you for that question. So that's why this process has taken us quite a number of months to put the contractual obligations in place. We hired additional outside legal counsel to advise the process and ultimately have very recently um, entered into contractual arrangements. Uh, there is some remaining work to be done before any data are shared under the new arrangement. And that involves ensuring that the final policies and procedures that dictate you know, at the granular level, the detail around how data are handled are well spelled out. And we have a written process in that contract to make sure that one cares compliance and legal officers review and approve those uh, procedures before we move forward and actually share any data. 
So if it's if you can, we'd certainly like to see um, those. And we'd also like to see the diligence that was done on UVM's security uh, prior to entering uh, this contract or agreeing to enter the contract. Um, and one of the questions I have is, what role or impact, if any, did UVM's 2020 cybersecurity breach have on your decision to give UVM access to all this information? So starting with the beginning, we can certainly provide you with the additional information. I, I would say that there was not a direct, direct impact from my lens of the cybersecurity attack and their response on the process that we went through. Um, we did, at the time that that occurred, provide all of the required notices. We did the extra evaluative work that was required, reported to our payers to ensure that uh, there really ultimately was not any detriment to any of the information that they held on behalf of OneCare. Sorry, so are you saying OneCare's data was previously exposed in UVM's prior breach? No, no it was not. In the end, it, it was, was not, not exposed. Got it. But it could have been, but it wasn't. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And then my question was, what role, how did you evaluate their um, response and hopefully enhance privacy protections in determining to give them more access to this information? Can you ask the, the question again, please? So UVM had a very large breach, which caused a lot of issues. And um, certainly when entities go through this, uh, you hope that they take significant remedial steps to prevent it from happening again. And I want to know what OneCare's evaluation was of that in determining to give them this information. So we could certainly uh, work with our internal team to get you some more information. What I can speak to directly is that um, not long after that time, we did some um, pretty extensive auditing work with them regarding the certification levels and the protections of data. Ultimately, they were found to be very well protected. And uh, as in any situation, there are obviously opportunities to continue to refine and enhance some of their procedures. And they put a, a work plan in place associated with that. So we did not have any findings that suggested that there were uh, concerns that would lead to hesitation as we moved forward. And you diligence that prior to giving them this information in connection with shifting your analytics to them? That process that I'm referring to was complete before we moved forward with this. And just to be clear, we have yet to give them any new information under this arrangement. And you all are UVMMC employees? Yes, right. our employment attachment is UVMMC. Do they set your salaries? Yes, we use the UVM MC compensation policy, but the board for me ultimately sets the CEO salary using the information gleaned from national standards. Um, I want to be respectful of my fellow board members' time and the healthcare advocate and the public. Um, just, I think, two little areas. Um, real quick, the benchmarking report. Is that a final report that we received? Uh, the vendor has listed it as a preliminary report, but agreed to allow it to be shared with the Green Mountain Care Board. Do you think it's accurate and can be relied upon for you to make decisions as to your practices and for the Care Board to make its decisions with regard to your budget? To the best of our knowledge, it's accurate at this time. I think the, the reservation is that it is brand new information and we at One Care, continue to need to spend time looking at it and asking follow-up questions. Um, in terms of the payment reform, uh, shared risk, um, it's set at I think thirty-six million dollars in the twenty-three budget. How did you come up with that amount, and why is that the right amount to incentivize the behaviors that you're trying to incentivize? I can take that one. So the. Generally, the way that the risk and reward amounts are determined is through what's called a risk corridor, which is a percentage above and below the benchmark set by payers. And those can, it can be anything you want. It could be a 1% corridor, it could be a 15% corridor. I would say that standard ACO arrangements tend to revolve around the 
the 5% range. Um, there's certainly ACOs that take on much greater um, corridors limits of up to 15%. We um, have largely, we negotiate those amounts with payers in, in order to find a balance between what type of uh, risk we're willing to take on as a provider network and what type of risk or amount of risk the payer thinks will generate the right attention um, under these programs. And um, again, through the pandemic, reduce that amount and the amounts that we have in the budget that ultimately determine this $36 million figure represent um, increases up closer to what we had prior to the pandemic, but in some cases a little bit lower. And the slight reductions relative to uh, the pre-pandemic years um, really reflect the fragility of Vermont's healthcare system. It's it's yeah, an me, important let me, tension. Let me pause you there just so I can, I got, I got to focus because I think I asked the sure. question poorly. Why is it $36 million and not $100 million? When we negotiate the terms with the total cost of care as set by the payer might be um, you know, $500 million, and then there's a risk corridor applied to that. And that determines the, the dollar figure, the maximum loss or the maximum savings that providers can receive. So would a greater number provide a more significant incentive to achieve the your goals of aligning um, conduct with curbing costs? It it would, but it would also present a, a concern in the sense that some providers might say the amount of risk I carry is too great for my organization and they might opt to not participate. So there is a balance to be struck. And how do you see the uh, I guess the word is fragility these days of the hospital's finances impacting the uh, temperature in terms of taking on risk? Very significant challenge. Um, when we started with these programs at the beginning of the all-payer model, the landscape was quite different. Uh, from a financial perspective, the pandemic has caused a lot of challenges. You guys heard it all through the hospital budget process. So. You know, like I said, I'm going to go back to the word balance and say that we want to resume more material risk sharing terms because it does get attention and it needs to be done very thoughtfully with a careful eye towards the financial health of our system. But if hospitals or providers have control over the outcomes, which I think is the intent, and they could achieve and make more money through this, wouldn't that be a good thing for them to do given the financial challenges they're facing, right? Like if you give me an opportunity to make more money and I need money, I think I want it so long as I have an ability to, to impact it. Why, why is that not what's happening? I agree with you. Um, but the factor that I think is important underneath it is what's the stability, the underlying stability of the organizations. And even as individuals, we might um, place a bet on something, but I wouldn't recommend placing a bet on a very fragile foundation. Thank you. That's a that's a fair point. If there are losses, let's say they owe back five million dollars as opposed to the five million they saved, who where would that money come from? Who would pay that? It's the hospitals, right? Largely the hospitals, correct. And how would the hospitals fund that? Would that be through um, Medicaid, Medicare, copays, all the various revenue streams they have? Basically, it would come off of their balance sheets, essentially. So would any executives or individuals who are responsible for that loss have actually any skin in the game? That's a good question. Um, we really put the organizations uh, rather than the individuals at risk in this. And one of the, the challenges that to bringing this provider network together is getting the governance structure for each of these hospitals to agree to the terms. So I think the, without speaking for them, I think executives would feel some responsibility to their boards in the sense that if they had to make a large share loss payment, their boards are, are going to consider that when evaluating management. Would that number, if there is a loss, come back through in our budget process here at the board? It would actually through the hospital budgets and less so through one care because we have a fully delegated or passed through shared savings and loss model. So essentially you could see a circumstance in which a hospital comes and said, boy, we had a rough year in these ACO programs and had to pay a $5 million shared loss payment. And so if the hospitals ultimately as an organization would foot the bill, is it fair to say that by and large Vermonters are paying that? given that's the source of the revenue stream, other than the Fed share, of course, which, you know, we're part of. 
I think through extension, there's some truth to that, but I will also add that the complexity of healthcare funding is, is huge. And if the general belief is that every dollar that funds healthcare comes from individual people, which is probably fair, then I'd say the answer is yes. So how would that actually change provider behavior, hospital executive behavior, if they're not on the hook for any of it? Every provider is really trying their best to sustain operations for their community, especially these hospitals, at least in my experience. And there's a balance to be struck between the activities that generate revenue under fee for service and doing the right thing for individual patients. And what we're trying to do here is align these two factors so that when providers do the right thing for the patients, they're also rewarded financially. That's what makes us successful. Thank you for that answer. Um, look like the commercial insurers are not doing fixed um, prospective payments. Why is that? I think there was a thing that said low marketability, technical limitations, risk tolerance. I think it's slide 19. Is that is that why the commercial insurers are not participating in that? I want to speak on behalf of the commercial insurers, and we may want to get into an executive session to discuss this in more depth as we are in active negotiations with them. Um, I think it's about shared alignment largely in terms of what we're trying to achieve through One Care Vermont and what their goals are. Um, but I'll leave it there so I don't step into some territory I should in public. Well, is there anything that's not confidential that you can share as to why you think, from your perspective, the commercial insurers are not participating in this? Again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the commercial insurers, um, so I'll. I'll I'll I'm just asking, leave it at I'm the asking for your for your perspective, not speaking for them, your perspective. My perspective, I think it's the alignment issue that I mentioned before. We're trying to install true fixed payments for providers that establish here's how much you, you should get paid for the work to care for this population. And I think some of the challenges that naturally come up are how do savings that the providers generate get back to uh, the rate payers, for example? That comes up as an interesting dynamic. And um, I think it's a valid point, but one that um, represents this kind of a misalignment between what we're trying to achieve with the provider system, how the system is funded and paid for, versus what the uh, commercial insurers see as their value proposition with their members. Okay, thank you. Um, the CEO compensation is projected to be $491,000 in fiscal year 23. Um, and I understood from the responses to the staff that that includes um, bonus. Does it also include retirement benefits, any sort of severance package, or any other financial benefits? And then corollary, are there any other financial components to the comp that are not included here? The table that we supplied was designed to be, um, it's a projection, but designed to be like what uh, an individual's taxable income would be. Um, along the lines of what is reported on a 990. It's a little difficult to project that, frankly, but that was the intent when we supplied that table. Thank you. Um, to the CEO, do you think you're adequately compensated? Yes, UVM MC goes through a very rigorous um, process to benchmark the CEO salary against other CEOs and like organizations. And the board reviews that and makes a determination on my annual salary. And do you think if you were compensated more generously, you would be greater incentivized to achieve outcomes for Vermont or would it not make a difference? Um, I think I'd like you to restate the question. Do you think additional compensation to you would provide an additional incentive for you to perform one Care's mission on behalf of Vermonters? No, per, from a personal, and I'm just going to speak on a personal basis because every CEO is different. I think that you need to be reimbursed based on fair market value and that individuals will make decisions based on what they hold important to them. And for me, um, it's the mission of One Care Vermont that brought me to One Care from the state, and that's how I continue to be um, passionate about that work. What was your salary uh, your first year as CEO? 
I do not recall. Well, I could get that for you, but what year did much. you become this? What year did you become the CEO? I've been the CEO for about three years now. So I think it was in 2019, August of 2019. The 990 from 2020 indicates the salary was 377,000 and now it's projected to be 491. What are the performance metrics that went into determining that increase? So remember, um, in certain years, and we can get you those details, um, all the executives took a pay reduction due to the pandemic and forfeited any of their variable pay as a part of that. So that those factors would have to be taken into consideration. So the not the 2020 990 at 377, you're saying is depressed because there were uh, variable comp not received. Correct. Let's see. And in terms of the 491 projected compensation, how much of that is uh, tied to incentive based compensation? Actually, just received an, uh, an email from the staff team and we'll supply a breakdown accordingly with the base versus incentive opportunity. Could you provide to me now? I need to have somebody on my team pull those data. I can try and get it during this meeting, but um, it'll take a little bit of work to break it apart. Um, what about last year? What percentage, and you can give me a ballpark, was the compensation for the CEO incentive-based? I don't know, Vicki, you recall. I can try and, let me try and look it up. Hang on. I, I don't recall. So it all follows UVM MC's policy of variable compensation, which the Green Mountain Care Board does have copies of. So at maximum, the CEO can obtain 25% of their base pay through variable compensation, and VPs have a different rate, and then directors have a different rate as well. That's set year over year, and that is assuming they pay out a variable compensation, which they do not in every year, and it's determined on whether or not we meet our corporate goals. And that that's what I'm trying to understand is how the comp is tied to the corporate goals and what the metrics are that is are being evaluated in determining what the comp should be. You, you do have a copy of our corporate goals year over year. So you would be able to look at those to see exactly what those corporate goals were. What I'm getting at is like, I wanna see how that translates in the evaluation, like to determine the CEO level compensation. Like I get what the corporate goals are, but are those actually scored or those, how are those evaluated in connection with determining compensation? The, those are scored. Um, uh, initially by our executive committee. Um, our executive committee of the board of managers makes a recommendation to the full board and the full board ultimately decides um, on whether or not there is a payout. If so, what is that percentage of that payout? And that's done on an annual basis. And do we have that? Do you know? I don't know that you had individual employee evaluations. I would not think you'd have that information. And from your perspective, does the executive, the CEO and the other executives compensation comply with rule 5.203A? You'd have to tell me what that rule is. I don't have it in front of me. Um, I can generally say what I think it is. I don't know if I have the language, but it's that the ACO structures executive comp to achieve specific and measurable goals, supporting the ACO's efforts to reduce costs and improve quality of care. Yes. Your comp is tied to those factors. Great. And would you serve as one care CEO if you received less compensation? No. I'm making more coffee, just so you know. Oh, okay. It's burning. Uh, sorry, I think there's a, another mic on. Uh, my question is, would you continue to serve as one care CEO if you received lower compensation? I think it would be dependent on what that compensation was and whether or not it was within fair market value for my services. 
All right, thank you all for um, answering my questions. I appreciate it very much. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jessica Holmes. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you for the efforts that you've gone into preparing the submission. Uh, appreciate that. I have some questions. Some questions have already been asked um, by other staff or Chair Foster, but I will go through the questions that I have remaining. Um, and some of your comments actually created new questions for me. So uh, one was, my first question was around the, um, how many, basically say so you have 5,128 5, providers. How many of those deliver primary care? About, just roughly, just trying to get a sense of how many of your providers in your network are primary care providers. We have 54 tax ID numbers. Um, we'd have to do the math for you on how many providers, because remember, UVM Medical Center is one tax ID number. They have hundreds of primary care providers. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I guess part of my question revolves around, you know, you had 78 respondents in your primary care engagement survey. So I'm trying to get a sense of whether you've assessed whether those providers are representative of all the primary care providers in your network. 78 seemed low to me, particularly now that you've said there's hundreds within UVM alone. So have you done an assessment to see whether they are representative of your primary care network? Uh, we've not done that assessment, but we don't dispute uh, kind of the, the concern that you have about the number 78 being low, it's actually quite a grave concern for us as well. Um, and one of the key learnings that our staff uh, are reflecting on right now to try to think about how to do better is, uh, is there a better or different mechanism to get the survey out to encourage engagement? So we tried to use kind of a networked approach where it went out to key people at the sites and then from them to the providers within their organization. And what we learned is that did not work very well despite multiple reminders and outreach. So part of what we need to do is A, be careful that we don't overstate the value of those preliminary pilot survey results, but yet we use them because I think there are some interesting signals that we start to see. And second, that we figure out how we change our strategy to better engage and get higher response rates for primary care, but also as we think about the other segments of our network that we want to survey. Yeah, and, and did this survey instrument include questions that gather specific examples of how one care's investments, data analytics, and payment incentives have fundamentally shifted how those providers actually deliver care? Like, is it is there evidence in that survey being collected about meaningful and measurable delivery system transformation that's directly linked to one care specific efforts. So if I if I'm understanding your question correctly, that it's really assessing like is the survey assessing change in behavior and outcomes? The answer would be yes. no. The survey was designed to actually look at um, people's understanding of healthcare reform the ease of use or the difficulty of use of some of OneCare's systems and tools, their knowledge and understanding. So it was it was framed quite differently than what you're suggesting. Well, then let me put in a, a pitch for then as you roll out the next version of this survey and hopefully have a greater response rate, I think it'd be really helpful. I think a lot of the questions that we've asked over the years around evaluation are trying to understand, you know, how do One Care Vermont specific policies, programs, investments change the delivery system and change outcomes for patients? And so asking specifically, if you've got a provider survey out in the field, that's a good way to assess how things that uh, One Care is doing are actually changing the delivery system. So I will put in a pitch for that, um, hopefully that you'll consider. Uh, happy to see that you're hiring an evaluator. Again, you know, this is something I've been pushing for years, trying to get more evaluation. Something that's weighed on me for the past year is that we've been celebrating, you know, our relatively low total cost of care for Medicare. Uh, and perhaps we should, but I want to ask you about our wait times. So our wait times are excessive in Vermont, particularly for specialty care, which is disproportionately used by seniors. So how does uh, for example, the Medicare benchmarking report or uh, One Care Vermont assess the role that wait times and access challenges might play in One Care's Medicare cost performance. 
I'll let Dr. Wolfman address some of this, but just to start in terms of the uh, Medicare benchmarking report, I think one of the early things that we are very interested in and concerned about is that um, in those reports, our ED utilization is particularly high. And uh, we have concerns that that is a signal that it is high perhaps because of access or wait time issues. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking at. We are digging in more deeply, as I mentioned earlier, specifically to the transitions of care issues. And I know that that the board is well aware of these as well. They're in the news, but um, really understanding how patients not being able to leave the hospital to get to say a skilled nursing facility or back to home with appropriate supports is definitely having an impact on their quality of care, their, the, you know, the, their desire for the, the place and, and services that they wanna receive. So I think what we're trying to do through this new lever is shine a different light on that and use the, the national benchmarking approach to really indicate that there are some, uh, there's some need, uh, some very specific need to look at certain parts of the system um, and try to address that. Now, I think it's premature to answer the question, what are we as an ACO going to do about it? Because as I mentioned, we haven't even disseminated all of this information yet, um, but it, it's critical ultimately to uh, the health of the healthcare system. I agree with what Sarah said, and I'll just add, I think we have a wait time problem for all areas of healthcare. It's not just specialty care. It's getting out of the hospital to go to SNF or rehab. It's for primary care. It's for, you name it, ER wait times are horrible, we know. So it's everywhere we look, and I think we cannot underestimate the impact of staffing issues that are huge in all those areas. I definitely think that we have um, the need to educate the patients more about where to go for their care. And I don't want us to underplay the responsibility of the patients in helping with you know, solving these problems. So if a patient of mine thinks they have um, a mole that needs checking and they don't get to see me on the day they want at the time they want, they might go to the ER. That has happened. So, uh, and many other examples I can give you. So I think we're working on this together with our providers in, in all kinds of different ways, but remains a heavy burden. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question about um, the budget then and, and thinking about, you know, where in the budget are, would we find resources allocated to address some of these opportunities that have been identified uh, in the Medicare benchmarking report for improvement, you know, specifically, you know, the lower than expected primary care usage, the higher than expected ED utilization that you mentioned. So where in the budget are we, will we see resources specifically allocated? I know you don't, may not have steps, uh, action steps identified, but are there resources already allocated to address opportunities for improvement? I think there's two parts to the answer to that question. The first is we just received the data and the budget was developed months prior. So, you know, there's a cycle that we have to go through to make some of those broader adjustments. Having said that, kind of knowing the, the broader landscape, I think you could look specifically to the enhanced support for the CPR program and the flexibilities that that provides for allocating funds within those sites for staffing and to meet some of those needs. Uh, and the second is a line item for specialty care, which we're still working on uh, some of the details, but Dr. Wolfman is leading some efforts with the state and with others around some of the problems in skilled nursing facilities right now. And so you'll hear more from us as that emerges over the next couple months. But those would be two examples. And just as a follow-up then, I recognize the budget was, was produced before this benchmarking report came out. Is there any appetite for shifting some of those resources now that you know a little bit more about the benchmarking report? You know, would you, if you could submit your budget now, would it be the same budget? I, I think our budget is built and approved by our board based on the amount of revenues that we have coming in from the hospitals and the payers. I don't think there's an appetite from the payers to give us more money for these services, but you could certainly ask them to. Um, no, I wasn't thinking that you would have to add more, but you might shift resources within the same dollar amount, right? So you might just shift programmatically allocation of resources given the um, data that you're receiving from the Medicare benchmarking report. 
I think the only challenge would be is that um, providers like primary care sign up based on the population health payment programs that we're supporting. And if you change that, you've, you've changed the contractual um, agreement that we've made with those providers who have signed on. So you could suffer a loss if you did that in your provider participants. Okay. Could I add um, a couple of clinical comments? Um, we are sure. also through our population health model incentivizing some of this work. So the two care coordination um, outcome measures that we have built into the population health model for 23 are follow up after two avoidable, potentially avoidable ED visits. So getting people in if they've had two ED visits in the last 90 days, incentivize people to get them in within the next 60 days so that they don't have a third one and working together on that across the care continuum. And then also hypertension follow-up is a process uh, improvement uh, that we are requesting as our care coordination, one of our two metrics for the population health model. So if somebody has a diagnosis of hypertension um, going forward, we're not just saying, oh yeah, this year again, it isn't controlled. We're saying get them in within a certain time frame in order to get credit so that they have adequate follow-up. So I think those are very important metrics that we are adopting for 23, and we will measure that. They will, um, you know, we will measure the outcome of uh, those two incentives. Okay. Um, my next area, you cite a few challenges um, to success, and I just wanted to probe a few that you mentioned. One was you cite as one challenge the expansion of enrollment in Medicare Advantage plans and highlight uh, that this needs to be addressed in future visioning. I think those are exactly the words that were used in the submission. So I'm wondering, what is the path forward uh, to achieve meaningful scale? And specifically, what role does the new collaboration between UVM Health Network and MBP play in the ACO's scale success and future visioning? I, I can... Um, speak to that. So as we discussed earlier, um, we, our initial strategic planning process, you know, started in 2021. The plan was at the time to roll that process through 2024 because we thought at that time there would be a, only a one-year extension to the all-payer model agreement, and instead we've gotten a two-year extension. Um, we have been highly focused this last year trying to understand if there will be any adjustments made in the current um, model, which we're being told are not. Um, and so next year, as part of our strategic planning process, we're going to have to understand um, what are other options that are available to us as an ACO that we can enter into directly with CMS, CMMI, the state, perhaps certain payer partners, if another all payer model agreement is not beneficial to our provider network. So that needs to be the process from which we build on in our strategic planning kind of refresh next year to look at what are those paths that would be viable to us as an ACO in Vermont. So that will be taken up as part of that strategic planning process. Okay. Um, with respect to the challenge that you cite about the absence of Medicare and commercial unreconciled fixed payments, I'll leave the Medicare aside for now and focus only on the commercial. And I know Chair Foster asked you this question and I recognize that some of it may have to be relegated for an executive session if we go in there, but perhaps I can ask it slightly differently that doesn't reveal confidences. Um, you reference these three barriers, technological limitations, low marketable value, and low risk tolerance from fee-for-service as the commercial barriers. So I'm wondering how you were able to successfully overcome those barriers in the CPR program and in the um, SVMC hospital pilot program and why those strategies can't be scaled up. Well, I'm not sure that we have solved it. Um, we have a, we, I'll call it a kind of a Band-Aid approach to make CPR work because it's been a priority area of ours. 
And by that, I mean, at the end of the year, we do have reconciliations between one care and the payers that require a reconciled payment. We just don't charge it to the CPR practices. It gets put, put into the hospital settlement. That is not my ideal scenario for this. And it, it is a barrier to making this a bigger and broader program. And um, so in short, I think we've made it work, but not in the ideal state. And the SPMC program, similarly? Yeah, I'd say it's similar. And credit to SPMC is that they offered to be a, a pilot site to help us test this out as a new initiative. And uh, they've largely stuck with it, I think, partially in hope that it would move to a, a truly unreconciled model. Um, if we could, I don't know if you have your so your submission in front of you, but I wanted to talk to you about uh, tables 6.1 to 6.3, the variance analysis. And this is looking at the revised fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23 variation. Um, and you list a 26% increase in revenues coming from the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program. And in the table, the tremendous growth in revenue is attributed to approved QHP filings. So can you help me understand how that where that 26% growth rate comes from? Premiums didn't rise by 26%. And according to slide 14, attribution to the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program is predicted to fall. So I'm really just trying to understand that growth rate. Sure, great question. That table. I, I can probably answer that better if I have a little bit more time with the numbers. But the my initial thinking is that it's um it's against what the number is referenced. So what what is the 26% reference against? If it was last year's budget, then that could be 26%. In other words, if last year's budget was lower than we anticipated, re reflective or relative to what we're experiencing in the market now, it could look like there's a bigger increase. But the way in which that the, tar the target was set was we looked at emerging 2022 spend data and built on top of that, if memory serves me, a 6% increase, which is identified as the medical expense component of the insurance rate trend. So that was pretty clean and straightforward. But if we're if the 26% is referenced against a prior year budget, there could be another variable to, to consider there. Well, maybe if you could follow up, that'd be helpful. This is, you know, in the variance table, it's the revised budget. So it's not the original budget, but it's the revised budget. So presumably... Okay. You know, you would have you know more up to date than the original uh, twenty two budget. So it would be helpful to us to understand. Happy to that do that. Rather large, and it, you know, it's a pretty significant amount of money as well, um, not only percentage wise, but also just dollars. Um, also, your your you budgeted one point eight seven million dollars for software, and I'm wondering if you can just give us some more details on that. I know your your sunsetting care navigator data analytics are being outsourced to UVM Health Network now under contracted services. So, what remains in that bucket of one point eight million dollars for software? Good question. So, th this is a transition period where. Um, OneCare largely has to maintain its ability to deliver analytic support to its network while the Arcadia system is being built up. So there are some software tools, um, including the current um, data warehouse tool that we still are paying for through this transition period. What we expect to see in future years is that we can start to sunset some of these software expenses as the new platform is up and running and ready to, to deliver supports to the OneCare network. So in a follow-up, would you be willing to supply some, a breakdown of that software and then what you anticipate will be sunsetted you know, in future years so we can understand what the ongoing software costs will be and what you're you know, maintaining in, in duplication this year? I think we could supply something like that as long as um, I'm always careful about disclosing software or uh, vendor pricing information, but if we can do it in a kind of a generalized way, I'm happy to do that. That would be Terrific. I, you can work with our legal team in terms of what's confidential and what would be allowable. Um, my other my other question in terms of the budget is around um, salaries plus purchase and contracted services. I'm adding the two together. 
because I recognize there's been movement, particularly this year, between the two with the new UVM Health Network data contract. So I'm going to call this a, a, a human capital bucket, if you will. Um, and that's hovered around nine to $10 million since 2018. Um, when I look at that bucket between 22 and 23, I see about a 12% jump. And I'm trying to figure that out because the number of employees is lower. Salaries are only rising by 3% on a smaller number of employees. And the UVM Health Network contract is supposed to be net neutral. So I'm trying to figure out where the 12%, you know, you go from in 2022, I think I have $10.7 million collectively in that bucket. And then in 2023, it's about $12 million. So can you help me understand that combined um, growth in the, what I'm deeming the human capital bucket? One moving part to mention is um, as part of the transition to uh, the UVM health network analytics model, the vital contract is now in that purchase services arrangement. So that's kind of a non human capital component. The other that I'll mention that has grown over time is legal expense. That's been a pretty significant growth area for us uh, over time. And more closely, it's also where our actuarial expenses live, which has been a growing expense as well. And audit, audit, audit has grown uh, from an expense base also. I think, you know, probably what would be really helpful is for us to understand some of that, if there's a way to deeper dive into that, because, I, you know, it's not clear from what you submitted where all those, where the changes in those dollars. Um, so I think particularly if you go from 22 to 23, it would be helpful for us to understand those moving parts with fewer employees, salaries rising only by 3%. Um, you know, if you add up the contracted and purchased services, it's hard for us to offset what is UVM and what is some of the other buckets of services that you're providing. So if you could just help us do that walkthrough, I think that would be helpful. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, all right, my last actual question is around, um, and I want to, because I'm also trying to be cognizant of as many other people that have to go after me. Uh, you submitted some data in Appendix 7.4 that uh, illustrates the proportion of patients in the high risk groups whose care is managed and coordinated. And to be honest, I was surprised um, by the proportion of high risk patients whose care is actually being managed is quite low. Um, only 5% of patients in the very, very high risk level report being, or you know, reportedly being managed and it's only 6% of high cost members. So I'm wondering if, you know, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Wolfman, did those reported percentages surprise you, given all the efforts that OneCare is taken to manage the care of the folks in that fourth quadrant? And how do we interpret those numbers? And I recognize I read the, all the footnotes there, and we can't compare 21 to 22, although I would like to, but I, I recognize we can't because it's a different uh, collection mechanism. But given the data in 2022, those numbers seem surprisingly low to me for that high-risk category. I agree they are lower than we would like. I can't give you all the reasons why. Uh, we are always driving towards maximizing that. Uh, I can look into it further. It does differ, differ across payers and it differs from HSA to HSA. So there are a lot of uh, factors that impact that, but obviously our goal is to keep moving that up. We, there's a little bit due also to switching from Care Navigator for record keeping to our new methods and that's settling out still. So we're still in transition. And so the rates may actually be higher than what we were able to report. Do you have, um, I guess I'm thinking, assuming your new population health management payment strategy and bonus incentive systems work, these numbers should rise next year. Uh, so could you submit, and if you don't have them today, understandable, but could you submit your target levels for what you're anticipating, the percentage of, of patients in each of those categories to be managed for next year so that we can get a sense of how well you're tracking progress towards those goals, given that you're changing your payment mechanism to try and maximize care management. Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, 
I think I'm going to kick it back over to you, Chair Foster, given how much time we have. I, I think you're fine if you'd like a little more. If you're all set, um, we can come back to if you'd like. Do you have more? Or you, all right. Well, let me, you know what? Go okay. ahead. And I, yeah, I, okay. I have a couple of questions, but I can, I'll see if others have those similar questions, then I can come back. Thank okay. you. Yeah. I sort of budgeted 30 to 45 minutes per per member. Um, and if people go over or under, it's totally fine. Uh, so next we'll go to um, Dr. Merman. Uh, hi, uh, Dave Merman, new on the board. Nice to meet uh, most of you for the first time, a few of you in the past. Um, and uh, I have uh, a lot of questions for you. I'll try to trim it down. Um, they keep growing through each hour. So. Uh, I guess uh, I just want to start with like a, an introductory remark, which is to say, you know, thanks for your budget submission and presentation and all of this overview. As you can understand, I'm sure uh, that um, coming to try to understand all of the intricacies in the last six weeks has been um, a bit of a lift for me as I've, I've my preconceptions of what an ACO and one care is have been completely flipped and I hope that I understand this well. So I may uh, have some redundancy in some of my questions of what things that you've covered elsewhere and I apologize for that. Um, I just want to be clear that you guys understand that our perspective in, on this is uh, from the care board is that we are tasked with, you know, we're a regulatory agency that's tasked with improving the health of the population of Vermonters, reducing the per capita growth and expenditures for health services in Vermont across all pairs, although I think we're, you know, particularly concerned about ones that affect um, Vermont uh, commercial payers and Medicaid, um, while ensuring access to care and quality is not compromised. Um, enhancing patient and healthcare professional experience of care and recruiting and retaining and achieving administrative simplification. So each component of the healthcare delivery system uh, shares many of these goals, but are often not entirely aligned by different market forces, incentives, and other priorities. So just understand that our questions and my questions today come from from this perspective, which is, um, and these aims, which is to drive the system-wide improvements in access, affordability, and quality in healthcare to, to improve the health of Vermonters. So with that sort of background, I guess the first question that I had in, in reading through all this and listening to all this is that clearly you are people that think a lot about healthcare, healthcare delivery, health of the patients, the population of Vermont. And so my first question is, and, and and I'd love to hear from any of you, is what you think as as a state, as a society, what are the things that we can do from here to improve the health of Vermonters? What not necessarily one care uh, or ACOs, but what what are some of the things that we could do? And 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 I guess then if there's some things that one care can address, then that's I guess the ones that are most exciting to me. Well, I can start at a very high level. I mean, what comes to mind for me is that I think we need to grow broader understanding of true population health, and we need to be putting more resources and intentionality around preventive-based activities. And I, I think that, you know, the healthcare system in the United States is kind of perverse in that sense, that we're really focused on treating acute care and illness and not enough upfront. And that's one of the issues that I will say we at One Care grapple with, but it's an issue that we hear from providers across the state as we have conversation. I can add to that, I have a couple different um, perspectives as well, um, or additional perspectives, let's say. First is having a healthy care delivery system. And I, I mean that broadly in that it's not just financial health of organizations, but there's provider satisfaction and they are ready, willing, and able to care for patients. So that's something I think about a lot in these programs is, you know, under CPR, the Comprehensive Payment Reform Program, for example, are providers actually more satisfied in this type of arrangement and therefore can deliver better healthcare? Their focus is more on the healthcare. So I, I do think about how do we make the healthcare system itself as high functioning as it can be, and then that should, in my view, lead to better health outcomes for patients. The other thing um, that's really in one care's wheelhouse, but not exclusively, is the use of data. I think the data that we have sheds light on opportunities that are otherwise invisible in our system, and we can really do a lot with these data in terms of identifying opportunities for specific interventions, specific inter improvement areas, so that we can collectively raise the bar and that, you know, every diabetic patient is well controlled now and we know exactly where we stand and can make measurable improvements over time. 
Yeah, Tom, I would just um, agree with what you said and add on in terms of workforce and having a happy and satisfied workforce. And I think part of that, that could be um, better reviewed or looked at and maybe something that the care board could take a look at is what are those administrative burdens that are being placed on healthcare providers right now? And is there a way um, to be able to streamline and simplify some of those burdens? Because what you're trying to do is create a better mousetrap in value-based care. Um, and you know you have to always have regulation um, and smart regulation is, is good regulation, but you can't put additional um, administrative burden on your already fragile system unless you have a real reason for doing it and making sure that the reason you're doing it is that people are going to be better off at the end of the day and people that's like all Vermonters like that's where we're trying to get at is are people better off because of this new system approach or not. You know, it's interesting I all three of you kind of spoke to things that I have further in questions and so uh, Vicki if I could start with you which is I'd actually cross this question out but but you know what? What what has one care has one as one care describes uh, that they do uh, in the in the, in the budget submission that there is a reduction in administrative burden, and I was wondering if there's a one is there a way that one care measures that reduction in administrative burden, or at least from a survey standpoint, if we know what reductions are occurring and if that could be quantified in some way as a decreased impact on those providers. I mean, we, we all know that primary care providers are burning out with pre-authorizations and complying with certain documentation and regulations, but what is what is one care done and how do they quantify it to reduce administrative burden? I can't, we haven't surveyed, right, to get an exact percentage on how we've done this, but I can tell you a few of the ways. So through our contract with Medicaid, the providers that are part of one care have administrative relief of prior authorizations for select services because they are agreeing to be accountable financially and clinically for certain measures. So that provides a measure of relief um, for all Medicaid um, individuals that are in the program and their providers as part of that. We have done things internally to be able to reduce administrative um, burden back to the providers as Carrie mentioned through our population health model, we used to have care coordination metrics, value-based incentive metrics, population health metrics. It was all in support of caring for the person and what better outcomes. So why don't we blend those all together, take a more holistic approach and get down to a few measures that are meaningful to providers. That's easier, that is not easy to do, right? because all payers have their requirements that they'd like to see and things we they'd like to measure. You as a Green Mountain Care Board have things that you would like us to measure. And so this is really trying to get at what are those measures that the clinicians believe are valuable to measure and patients are better off because of it. So those are two concrete examples of things one care has done um, to be able to reduce the administrative burden on healthcare providers. And the payment reform alone provides a lot of flexibility in terms of the way care is delivered to Vermonters um, and not having to be tied to certain CPT and ICD-9 codes in order to bill for those services. So. Um, more flexibility in the way that care is delivered is what I would say. Um, Sarah, I want to just follow up on your thing with uh, prevention. I think one of the things that we struggle conceptually with, I think you're a pediatrician or were a pediatrician or are a pediatrician or once maybe worked in pediatrics. No, just worked with them for a long time. Not them. one, okay, though. Like, because, you know, pediatric is is really the place where prevention, you know, is occurring and, uh, you know, for primary prevention, and then we're sort of stuck with secondary prevention, you know, and, and the, for the bulk of our years. And that a lot of the metrics that we're using to evaluate the quality of health in Vermont are A1C scores, hypertension, depression screening, 
I, I don't know, I guess from my perspective, I feel like we're just sort of scratching the surface of what really healthcare's value is when we're talking about those things. Um, and that prevention really is almost precedes the delivery of healthcare. But um, with that in mind, are, are you, um, do, do you feel that, that these uh, metrics that we're following, like A1C less than nine, I, I think I, I couldn't figure it all out. So it looked like it was A1C less than nine, systolic blood pressure less than 140, uh, depression screenings, are, are these, do we know, do you have any understanding whether or not this is, I mean, a lot of these are really long-term things. But in the short term, are, are, do you have any data or signals maybe that this is, is is reducing cost, reducing disease, reducing hospitalizations? Uh, you're asking a wonderful million bazillion dollar question, really. Um, and so I think there's multiple components to it. I, I spent many years working with pediatricians and family practice physicians. And you know, from that process, learned that really a multi-generational approach to thinking about and integrating, you know, medical need and social need is incredibly complex and quite necessary to be thinking about the, the primary prevention strategies. And so, you know, One Care has a couple of things that we're working on. With respect to the quality measures, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. We look at you know chronic disease management, and that's an important component to controlling costs and improving outcomes. But we also look at proxies for preventive care. So um, for children and for adults, we look at the use of wellness visits, um, you know, age-appropriate wellness visits, screenings, uh, developmental screening for kids being a good example, depression screening for adolescents and, and older adults. And that's just the start. Um, we also really try to think about where there's space for innovation. So you'll see One Care in its budget continues to invest in a program called Dulce, which is a partnership between local pediatricians' offices, parent child centers, and legal aid to really uh, support new parents parents of newborns and young children to identify some of those social stressors, environmental needs, and provide immediate referral and linkage to services to really try to get in front of um, and make a generational impact on some of those um, challenges that have existed. So that's, it's small. And one of the challenges we've had, frankly, is how do you expand that model statewide when the birth rate is declining and we might not see, you know, in each practice enough newborns to actually make that model work. But we continue to think about, you know, what are the strategies and what's the right place for those strategies? Is it in the, the patient-centered medical home? Is it in the community? Is it partnering in, in a different way? I think one of the things that I'm struggling with when I'm trying to understand what the potential impact of an ACO is within preventative care is this, this, this charge of the care board, which is trying to reduce the per capita growth rate of expenditures in healthcare, and it seems that you know we can throw so much at prevention. The the gains of that are five, 10, 20, 30 years out, and we've got this sort of you know confluence of crises going on right now, where hospitals' budgets are really struggling, insurance rates are going through the roof, inflation, staffing, and whatnot. So I guess to follow up on that question, I, I guess you know. When 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 you when you all as one care or as individuals think about cost drivers in healthcare, you know, and and what those are, are there cost drivers in healthcare that you think that one care, I guess actually as one care, can one care augment these things that are driving up the cost of healthcare? And if so, how? Well, I think one care tries in to the augment short, in it. the shorter term, as I guess yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's the difficult challenge right there is the, the timeline. And so I think what we continue to struggle with and have conversations through all levels of our governance is how do you manage these one year payer contract cycles and, and performance expectations with mid and long term outcomes that our clinicians remind us all the time it's going to take years, decades, generations to address. And so I don't know of a secret formula that says here's exactly how much we should be investing in in prevention specifically versus chronic disease management. I think we're continuing to refine that. But one of the most important messages that we uh, as the staff at One Care try to convey all the time to our provider network is that using the data, not 
everything needs to go down. Like costs may need to go up in primary care. We might need to actually incentivize more visits for people who are very fragile or have needs. And that's okay and good. That just needs to be offset with a broader vision of where are the avoidable, you know, areas of utilization and how do we address those all? So I guess where how do you address the avoidable areas of utilization? And, you know, I think the big expensive utilizers are you know, or the big expensive cost centers are going to be hospital-based procedures, admissions, visits. How, how does one care incentivize people to get care um, in other locations or in less expensive hospitals, EDs, places to get procedures? I think there's multiple strategies, but as Dr. Wolfman spoke about a moment ago, certainly our care coordination program is a large part of it. And the work that we've done in the last couple of years to get more precise in sharing information, not just about a large swath of individuals that might benefit from generalized care coordination, but specifically looking at those who are showing back up at the emergency department. Does, does, one, does one care have like any specific programs to try to encourage hospitals? Well, I mean, it's such a tricky time right now. So like, you know, hospitals are so struggling, the budgets are complicated, the labor costs are through the roof. I mean, I, I think, you know, I work in the emergency department, our volumes are super high. The census of the hospital is super high, the sensitive of the SNFs is super high, you know, access is super low. It's a really complicated time to work, but at the same time, you know, boom, I mean, costs are just going up super, very quickly in healthcare, you know, Year, year over year, um, are there programs that OneCare has to work specifically with hospitals to try to reduce costs within hospitals or push hospitals to encourage hospitals to move, say, to outpatient surgery centers or other lower cost areas to deliver care? Tom, do you want to speak? Yeah. I'll put in a plug here for payment reform. Um, and that if we can change the way that these high high expense um, areas of the healthcare system are paid and one that's more of a, I'll call it a capacity based model rather than a volume based model, it, it does help to stabilize overall costs. And the challenge is it places on those facilities and organizations is to live within those means of here's here's your you know Medicaid fixed payment for the year. You need to run your organization in a way that lives within that budget amount. and. And then on top of that, you layer in the potential for shared savings or loss as another factor. So what I hope happens to these programs is that all of a sudden the, these, the hospitals see, all right, I'm, my, my budget for Medicaid is paid. And now if I do extra, which is move care to lower cost settings and do better work with prevention, I can also earn some shared savings. And then I think the system starts to work better and is more so focused Medicaid on the health outcomes. So Medicaid with fixed perspective payments has some of that now, would you say, that the, the fixed perspective payments going to hospitals would incentivize hospitals to be, try to figure out how to be more cost effective while maintaining quality in their care? Yes, I would agree. And then what are the quality metrics then for hospitals within that? That's a good question. We, we're starting to discuss that with uh, DIVA around this Medicaid fixed payment expansion initiative, but largely it's been the same quality measures that we're accountable for broadly under these ACO arrangements. But uh, I expect there to be some more um, facility-specific quality factors uh, looked at in the future. I think one, one question, I'm kind of scattering around my questions here, but I appreciate your guys' comments. But one question I had that I when I was reading through the budget submission, which I think was kind of an anecdote regarding a potential cost savings in the Burlington HSA was uh, how the, um, uh, it, I, I'm just gonna read what I have, an example how, of how one care is improving care and that is discussed in the Burlington HSA, reductions in the increase in admission rate growth. And that there's this observation that the Burlington HSA limited the increase in admissions from, I think it was 2021 to 2022, from like seven-ish percent to 1% increase in growth. And that was thought to be um, is listed as, as a quality improvement. Um, and I guess, I guess, how can you observe that this decrease in admissions is a quality improvement due to one care? 
I think ultimately we're very cautious about questions of causality because as I talked about earlier, there are so many different interventions, so many organizations that are involved in these things. What we focus on is trying to provide the data, the resources, the information, and when we see best practices that we try to serve as a vehicle to disseminate, you know, what is happening in the Northeast Kingdom that maybe the, the Southwest of the state would wanna know about or vice versa. And more recently, one of the mechanisms we've just started using to help facilitate that is by inviting some of our network to present at public sessions of our board meeting to really highlight some of those success stories. And we'd like to see more of that happen. Yeah, I, I think this specific thing that concerned me was like, you know, is this increased quality or is this decreased access? And are we are we seeing the impact of, you know, difficulties of getting inpatient beds in the Burlington HSA? And that's why admissions are down. And I know that patients board often for a long time at hospital in the Burlington HSA and that they, you know, subsequently don't get admitted. So I, I sometimes they get nervous with some of these, as you mentioned, sort of causative sounding things that really are, are observational. Um, uh, let me just flip to one other. Oh, you know, I, I wanted to bring up another issue that I think, and I'll try to have my sort of drawn out uh, case story is an emergency physician seeing elderly patients who are, you know, near the end of their lives. But when the, basically it gets to the point that I think a lot of my patients really want, um, struggle with having really intimate conversations with their providers. And, it, and they're focused on, diabetes management, hypertension management, when really like they're trying to figure out how to, to manage the later years in their lives, which gets into the question of goals of care. And often in the emergency department, we'll see patients who don't really have well-established goals of care that are critically ill. And uh, and we spend, you know, we're, we're happy to connect with these patients and it's really incredible work, but it often feels like we're doing a lot of really expensive testing, interventions, unnecessary testing, hospitalizations, when it really kind of turns out over a period of time that really this is not consistent with what this person would want in their life. And so I guess my question is, 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 what's, is one care looking at trying to incentivize providers to have goals of care conversations, palliative care type conversations, end of life care conversations with patients in sort of in a, in a way that, that, that is, is, is you know universal i'd love to answer that <laughs> hi dr merman um hi. i am a family i'm a family doctor in brandon where i've worked for 24 years and i still see patients and i couldn't agree with you more on that topic uh it isn't solving it quickly but we are convening a work group to work on that kind of topic i'm a, a big believer in planning for appropriate care in the primary care home and being willing to have those discussions in a timely fashion. So if a patient doesn't really wanna be in the ER and run up um, a huge bill with expensive testing, then that doesn't happen. Um, or if they do, let's talk about why. Uh, so uh, a special, we're going to have um, a work, work group called um, Living Fully Supported, and it will include topics like that and palliative care and sniff challenges, et cetera. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think it's just incredibly important work. I'm no, I've, I know you work as a family doc, and I'm sure that's a, a daily patient interaction is trying to figure those things out. Um, I have a few more questions, which is also, is one care able to do anything to try to improve the complex issues relating to SNFs and rehab facility access, staffing? Is there any any levers in your guys' wheelhouse that you can move to try to improve uh, the ability to move patients from inpatient to longer term care? I'm happy to answer that also, if if that's okay. We have been having discussions with the state and with the UVM Health Network Medical Group um, administrators and with a lot of different providers, as well as the medical directors throughout the state um, who oversee SNFs. Uh, about this problem. And we are moving the needle forward slowly. I have a meeting tomorrow again about this, but OneCare uh, has put aside some funds and is willing to help with uh, a pilot and some initiatives in this area. Uh, we haven't uh, firmed up the whole plan yet, but more to come. And we are focused in on helping with this issue. Because yeah, I 
when I think of cost drivers in our system right now, I guess I feel like the the challenges of moving people out of the highest cost settings into lower cost settings who don't need that level of care is, is probably a pretty significant cost driver. Um, I very much agree. So I have a few questions that came up while we were talking here today. Um, Oh, I have one uh, here. I have a few prior questions. So regarding the Medicaid total cost of care, so I see it as on page 22 of the budget submission is $306 million, but only $171 million is unreconciled. Is that, is that difference due to the non-attributed Medicaid patients, or is there another reason why the rest of that is not unreconciled? Great question. So the way that total cost of care is determined is we take the attributed population, which is around 100,000 roughly for, for Medicaid, and project the total cost of care for, for those patients. And that is really the total cost of care. It's um, healthcare expenditures, regardless of where it's delivered, whether locally, down in Massachusetts and, and Florida. The subset in the fixed payment represents just that portion of care at the providers accepting a fixed payment. So just at the Vermont hospitals who are under the fixed payment arrangement. For the other care, it is paid by Medicaid on a fee-for-service basis. So they build a claim, Medicaid pays it, but it's part of our accountability and ultimately determines whether or not shared savings are earned or shared losses are owed. Okay, thank you, that's super helpful. So, and then to pivot to the whole, one care UVM relationship, which I must admit is something that I don't think I quite understood before today. Um, so I guess, first of all, so is one care a subsidiary of UVM MC or UVM HN, or is it a separate organization? We, we are a separate LLC 501c3 organization whose sole parent um, our sole member is UVM Health Network. Our members used to be UVM, MC, and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. That changed about a year and a half ago to UVM Health Network being our sole member. I would say the difference between um, what you might see with other UVM Health Network affiliates is that um, our board of managers is fully responsible in charge of our budget, um, personnel, strategy, expenses, um, and UVM Health Network does have members on that board. Do you, Vicki, have a reporting structure within the UVM Health Network other than the board? I do the, not. not. Not the board, the board of OneCare? I do not. My direct reporting structure is up to the board of managers. So only the board of managers can hire and fire the CEO or the officers of the board, me being one of them. Okay. And then given that the DMO is now going to be managing all this data, which my, my understanding at UVM Health Network is the DMO is under the CFO's reporting structure. Is Rick is Rick Vincent going to have any? Is what's his relationship to the data that then is going to be held by OneCare? Is this is this is how does that work? To kind of simplify it, think of UVM Health Network as OneCare's vendor providing data and analytics. So it's a purely contractual agreement between OneCare and UVM Health Network. So, and I, to get back to one of Owen's questions, then why would, why can't one care just contract with Arcadia? What's the intervening step that the DMO does that, that, that they need to do? So one care could hold its very own contract distinctly with Arcadia. Um, in terms of economies of scale, that might mean that we have a lesser, like we have to pay more of a PMPM to hold that payment directly with Arcadia. So Does UVM that, have other contracts with Arcadia? Is that the? No, I'm just saying for us to have our own separate and distinct contract with Arcadia versus buying a whole kind of 
suite of both tools and personnel would come at an increased cost for one care. So what's D, what's the DMO doing? What's the intervening step that the DMO does between one care and Arcadia then? That that you said you have the suite, the suite. I assume the suite is the DMO part. It's the tool and the people. So, so Arcadia, and if you couldn't just independently contract with Arcadia without having another layer of data management people at One Care. Is that what you're saying? Right. Correct. But then there's people leaving One Care to go to the DMO to do this job. Yeah, so yes, that's remember, correct. Yes. Remember, we're all UVM MC employees. Um, but now it moves it um, off from our financials as a direct FTE to a contracted service. So maybe two, two points I could add. One is that the general philosophy behind how the agreement is structured is that it's focused on the deliverables and the expectations, not on um, account of the number of people. So that, that's important because it's our board that's real at One Care that's really saying we want better analytics. We want them to be more customized for specific audiences. We want more flexibility around them. And then the other reality, just in terms of software in this field in general, not speaking of anyone specifically, is that a lot of their payment structures or their fee structures are based on volume. So the more lives you bring in, the lower a PMPM or a PMPY might be for those costs. So ultimately, we can leverage more buying power in any of these analytic services when we think about that combination of the lives that are not part of one care sitting in one place, one care lives being under this sort of master agreement. I guess, I guess the reason why I bring this up and I think we're all kind of hung up on it is the optics of this are kind of kind of awkward and challenging. I mean, I think that if you if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's not who's a competitor of UVM, say for instance, or a patient who sees a competitor of UVM for their healthcare, now more consolidation of one care within UVM kind of kind of creates a little bit of a concern or an image, potentially an optical image of a concern that UVM and one care are, you know, working together to sort of to potentially benefit UVM. I think what you're saying is that there are firewalls and protections and organizational structures to prevent that. But I, I would imagine you could you could see that without this clear hearing or a clear idea that that is on the surface, it's UVM employees taking UVMM data services under the CFO's management to, to aggregate quality and operational data throughout the whole state, it just has a, it has some challenges to it, I think, that I, I don't, yeah. I don't know, just optically. I, I get that. I totally agree with you that um, there's always going to be optical challenges. And then there's the practicality of the fact that we've put in safeguards um, to be able to protect against that. And we could spend all day talking about what those safeguards are. There's also the realities is that if One Care Vermont went out and tried to do all of this on our own without the support of our sole member organization, we'd have to hire our own HR team, we'd have to hire our own payroll team, we'd have to hire our own IT and security. So we'd be bringing forward a budget to you that is way more than the current one that we're bringing right now. So by aligning and sharing and not duplicating resources actually enables us to bring in a budget um, that's lower than would otherwise be um, if we weren't sharing these resources, which would mean that our participating hospitals that are not UVM Health Network would be paying more for the services than they are right now because our budget would be even higher. So there's the optics and then there's the organizational um, business of making sure that we're keeping our operational costs as low as we can so that we're good stewards of the state. I guess the, the one other thing that you bring up with that too is the organizational costs. You have this really nice graph of them declining over time as a percentage. Do you have a similar graph showing 
um, the the uh, the shared savings by your your um, attribution as well, if that's changed over time or if that sort of offsets, if that's related to the to the attribution. Uh, in the submitted materials, there's shared savings earned year over year. Um, happy to consolidate it if that would be helpful, but um, is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, I guess I, the, the graph that you showed is really, really helpful to see is there, and I was just, and I haven't, I did look at the shared savings, but I didn't look at it as, at as a percent of the total attributed lives or a percent of the total budget like you do okay. with the graph of the of the total budget. And I think that would be a kind of a helpful visual to understand um, how successful you guys have been at sort of working with the various, you know, provider networks towards shared savings. Yep. I, I think I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I guess that's all I have for right now. I thank you so much. I'm um, gonna pass it back to Owen. Thank you. Um, just uh, let's take a Cassidy. How long of a break would you like? Oh, five five minutes would be great. Okay, we'll come back at two thirty six. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, and we'll turn it over to uh, Tom Walsh for his questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Cassidy, for your help today. Thank you for um, One Care members for joining us and uh, spending a long day of answering questions. I want to turn to um, outcomes and process improvement, if you don't mind. Um, what is uh, the outcome measure that you believe best demonstrates the value that One Care provides to Vermonters? Sorry, I can't get myself off from mute. So I have no trouble too. I I would say that um, the federal government has created a national framework through the Medicare program to evaluate ACOs success in quality of care programs that follow care coordination, patient safety and experience, and overall chronic disease management. And they also have a framework for looking at um, savings and losses um, per ACO. So at an overarching level, Vermont is no different in that we follow the framework that was very carefully selected by the federal government in evaluating the success of our programs year over year. And we do that across payers. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm familiar with the framework. Um, I don't know that Vermonters are. And there's there are concerns that the organization, the accountable care organization is, is costly but we, it's hard to identify the benefit. And I, I'm just trying to, to help with that a little bit. And so from that framework, um, what's the biggest, the best outcome? I think if you ask a thousand clinicians, you'd probably get a thousand different answers on what is the best outcome because they're all different. Well, I'm, 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 asking, I'm asking one care leadership. I can take a stab at this. Um, I think there's a lot of, of different um, ways value can be measured, but to, since you asked for a number, but I'll, I'll give two. Is best? The two numbers that I, I think of first and foremost are 296,000 lives and $1.4 billion. And I say that because what One Care has done is put the care for those lives into accountable relationships, meaning that the providers that care for these uh, individuals are now accountable to quality. I appreciate that, I appreciate that Tom. And I, I don't need to have ACOs described to me. What's the outcome that you believe has had the biggest impact for Vermonters? Well, that's the one I, I th believe. I, th I think that's so, what Tom so is. Let me just let me follow up with Tom, please. Um, you believe that the number of lives covered is the best outcome? What I was saying is that I believe having the care for these lives in value-based arrangements is a very positive outcome. And absent one care offering okay. these arrangements and programs, 
the way I see it is that everybody just goes back to their own corners of the healthcare system and and does things the way they've been done for decades. Okay, so what I, what I'm struggling for, right, is is to find an outcome that would be meaningful to Vermonters. And you may be able to say something like reduced ED visits, and then I could follow up and say, is that the same across all hospital service areas? And you might be able to say, no, we have some that are underperforming, some that are performing well, and we're trying to learn from each other. I could ask reduced ED visits, is that the same for white and non-white patients? Those are outcome measures that matter to patients and I can't find them. What I find on page six of your executive summary are things like, we've made measurable progress, including modifying coordination programs, engaging stakeholders, redesigning committees, testing models, and developing a plan. That's not really what I have in mind when I think of measurable progress, right? And it's like, like Chair Foster said at the beginning, I think we need to change a lot about the way healthcare gets done um, across the country and here in Vermont. The Vermonters deserve better, right? I want one care to succeed. So please keep that in mind as I work through these questions. Outcomes are first mentioned on page 49 of the submission, the narrative submission you sent to us, and you outlined four categories of that you put patients into, healthy, stable, rising risk, complex, right? Earlier, there was a question, and it was less than 10% of the patients in the complex bucket receive coordinated care. Somebody's defining that and saying it's coordinated care. Now, that didn't surprise me at all, right? I don't think that that's underperformance necessarily because they could be in the complex bucket because they're not getting coordinated care. They're hard to get a hold of to coordinate care with, or they have a hard time accessing services in our, in our delivery system, right? But I don't see what's happened to that number since 2016. I don't see any outcomes stratified by those groups. I see a CMS report card for Medicaid ACO work, and the overall grade on the report card is around 69%. What's the corrective action you're planning to take to improve that score? Carrie, I can probably let you speak to this, but a lot of the questions that you have surround um, providers' ability to impact care and to change care delivery. That's right. right? Is not and one so, of your aims to improve the coordination of care? Right. And, and so our, to do that? our job at the ACO is to provide them the data, the analytics, the supports, the insights and the payment reforms to enable them to do that. That's what One Care does, and that's what we should be evaluated on. The outcomes yeah, so are provider, let me finish. <laughs> the outcomes are driven by our care delivery system, which are frontline providers who are hurting from a workforce perspective, hurting from a financial perspective. So I would ask, what is a system in totality doing to help clinicians deliver care, just deliver care on a day-to-day -day basis? So what we're doing is a small part in helping them in value-based care arrangements. I, pre I appreciate that. And if, one care's role was to support through data analytics, maybe training, some other things. Over time, wouldn't there be improvements that we could point to? 
right? If we look year over year and it's been going on for five or six years, wouldn't there be improvements that we could point to, even if it's just a little piece? And I think Carrie was showing some of those improvements that we've had in select measures. And you also have to remember that we've been living in a pandemic for the last three years. And so really um, evaluating <laughs> while we've been living during a pandemic and care delivery has had to radically turn itself on its head just to deliver basic care for our patients, I think that's an unfair expectations to put on our providers during a time that they've been struggling to take care of patients. But Carrie, I don't know if you'd like to say more about that as a frontline provider of care. Sure, I agree with the last comments you just made there, Vicki and Tom, my answer to your question about outcomes. I, when I think about what patients, their families and caregivers want, I believe we want wellness, first of all. And after that, we would like access to care. and. Granted, not everybody wants the same kind of access. We touched on that earlier, but I do believe that most people want primary care access. I think most people know that's where they're gonna get the best care and help education and help staying well or being treated when they're sick. I don't think people wanna to go to the ER necessarily or be in the hospital. So I think people want more primary care. They want their basic needs met, which is why we're studying social determinants of health and finding out where that intersects with the quality metrics that we are working on and I think people want their care coordinated. That's very different in my book than needing a care manager, although that's a, a section of it. But we all want our care coordinated. We don't want confusion, we want communication. If we have a mammogram and it's abnormal, I don't wanna know that next week. I want it today, I want it tomorrow at least, or as soon as possible. So I think those are the basics that we want. And I think that the support, the data and the, support, the supports that we're giving our members are pushing in that direction. We have been in a pandemic. Primary care access has crashed. You know, it's it's been a mess. People go to the ER or they stay away from their primary care on purpose because they don't want to be exposed, et cetera. So it has been a hard time to measure this. But going forward, what we're pushing are these very things, getting access in the right location, being accessible, providing coordinated care, and also I think for primary care to move in the direction of team-based care is a big piece of this as well, so that we have in the primary care home the components that our patients need access to. They may need a behavioral therapist, they may need a dietitian, and when that's all more centralized, I think we can provide better preventive care and better sick care as well. Yeah, I appreciate, uh I appreciate that too. And and <laughs> I understand that we've been in a pandemic and it's disrupted everything. It's disrupted everybody's lives. And most of us have family members that have been severely affected. It's no small thing. Right? I get it. If there was a mature service organization following outcomes and working to improve processes, we'd see tables and charts of where things were at the beginning, what's the, the current system performance, what interventions have we utilized, and what's the performance now, right? What impact we've had. Then we could say, oh, we, we had a small impact, but there was a pandemic. I, I don't see things like that in your submission. I see a lot of different graphs from a lot of different places and a lot of reference to um, federal government things. But when we're trying to assess the budget of one care and being able to meet our charge the way that Dave outlined, we need to be able to assess the outcomes and the improvements that the organization is meeting to justify the budget. And I want to see those things but I don't. I think what you're asking for, Tom, um, would require that we were in a stable state every single year. So for instance, our network and our attribution and our patients were different in 2017, than they were in 2018, than they were in 2019, and so on and so forth. So it's not a straight line 
that we can be able to measure year over year because year over year, we look very different from a composition point of view in terms of both providers, practitioners, and payers that attribute. So what you get from us is an annual evaluation on the current state of affairs. And what you're getting with a NORC evaluation is a more comprehensive qualitative and quantitative analysis of how the system is working. And that's what they're being paid to do. Yeah, I, I read through that carefully. They do a good job. And there were some promising things that were happening in the first couple of years, for sure. Right. Um, they kind of flip around a little bit. They they talked Nork talked about some reductions in ED visit utilization. Some more recent things looks like ED visits are are higher, right? So there's conflicting aspects. But we can at least try to follow it and talk about it when we have those outcome measures. Right. And it's I understand the the composition of the participating providers changes. That's not unique to Vermont. Before I did this job, my other work was working, some of it involved working with ACOs who were trying to form or trying to improve. That problem isn't unique, but they can generate outcomes and they can show process improvement and change in outcomes as a result. You, you started to talk about um, key performance indicators in, in the submission. Um, it, what are your top three key performance indicators? So we're working right now through the process I described with the UVM HSR team. They did the research. We have a set of uh, 10 or 12 KPIs, and they are going to our board to be reviewed. And in particular, we want to look at them in terms of their alignment with the Medicare benchmarking report. I would say globally there's pretty good alignment, but I don't want to be in front of our governance process and saying what those final measures are. We'd be happy to follow up with you as soon as that conversation happens, though. Yeah, that, that'd be great, right? You're, you're here before us, and we're reviewing the, the budget, and it would, and this isn't the first year you've been doing it, and it would be part of preparing for this. So here's our performance indicators. Here's how they've changed over time. Here's our strategy and tactics going forward. In the submission to us, we had things, um, the key framing questions about the KPIs were what's in our sphere of influence and what will best demonstrate our value or potential value. Those seem very relevant to one care but not particularly relevant to Vermonters. Me meanwhile, right, we're, we're talking about six years in, figuring out KPIs and whether they're in our in, in your influence or not, or whether they'll demonstrate how good we're doing or not. Suicides are at an all-time high in Vermont. Right. We've got ED visits, according to the latest da data, that are 29 to 37% above those of comparison ACOs. Many of those <clears throat> suicide attempts or depression, anxiety, um, people seeking care for that, it's very difficult to get in to see a primary care provider or a psychologist. Oftentimes you need to use telemedicine and go out of state to have access to those. Um, given the high rate of ED visits, given the difficulties with mental health and substance use disorder, does One Care have an action plan to address those needs? Harry or Sarah, do you want to take that briefly? We have an action plan to address avoidable ED visits built into our population health model, and I already described that briefly. We can come back around when we meet with you later on our whole quality update and give you more information about that. 
and we don't have our own personal organizational um, project, if you will, on reducing suicide, but we have had many discussions and some of the uh, leaders are working together with other efforts that are going on in the state that we want to support. We don't want to start something new. There are efforts going on with the Department of Health, with the Howard Center, et cetera. We are in conversations with those groups and plan to join and uh, provide our support there. In a, in a very in a very um, you know real way, not just not just giving you um, lip service. I appreciate that, and I'm I'm glad we'll be able to follow up more about about quality, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, the ED visits, the wait time issues, part of, of One Care's mission as outlined at the beginning of, of this meeting was addressing care coordination. What, what role do you all see as one, that One Care has in addressing the wait times issue in Vermont? There are, as we talked about earlier, wait times um, at all locations. So are you talking about all those locations or just ER wait times right now? Um, I'm wondering if One Care has, sees itself as having a role in helping address the issue of wait times across the state. Absolutely. Can you describe the role, please? I think the role is multifaceted depending on the care setting. So, and I believe that they've all been touched on at least briefly today. So working with a consortium on uh, providing some physician coverage for the SNFs because they're in a crisis with um, not enough physician care. Therefore, throughput from the hospital to SNFs is, uh, has a roadblock. So we're working on that. We are incentivizing uh, wellness visits in our population health model that requires people opening up access in the primary care home and getting their patients in for wellness visits. That's child, adolescent, and adult age 40 and up. So those are some of the examples, but definitely top of mind in, in all of our clinical work. Great. Um, I appreciate you helping me understand more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you talk about data analytics to support providers. And um, in the narrative that you submitted, um, you write that in the you're in the process of developing a survey for primary care providers. And at this point, the work in progress is to explore the practical implications of deploying the survey and increasing the response rate. Could you explain what exploring practical implications of deploying the survey means? Yes, I'm happy to do that. I took the survey and I helped to deploy the survey. So we worked with the research group at UVM on this and um, there are, we learned a lot, a lot of lessons learned first time to do it. We sent the survey link to leaders in healthcare throughout the state and asked them to ask their primary care force to take the survey. So instead of sending out an email to the whole list, we used other local healthcare uh, leaders to see if they could get their primary care uh, providers to answer the survey. We thought that would be more effective. Hoping for a snowball effect. I think it was more personal, that's why we did it. Um, it was not effective. People are busy. Um, I took the survey, it took maybe 10 minutes, but people, several people started it and stopped. They either didn't like it or they got interrupted. So there are multiple reasons why um, we didn't have more success or as much success as we wanted. 80 responses throughout the state, like Jessica's mentioned earlier, that's not a very high response, but we had to kind of do some extra calling to get that many people to respond. So, you know, I sent some emails later to the leaders reminding them, please ask your people to take the survey. So many reasons why um, getting this off the ground wasn't exactly what we wanted, but again, we're learning from it. And there were questions in the survey about what does One Care do for you? What does One Care not do for you? We didn't ask for written answers. They were more agree, disagree, strongly agree, you know, a lineup of responses, uh, multiple choice. So that also has its limits. We would have liked to ask for some written responses, but we thought this year, let's just get a survey off the ground and get some responses going and learn from that. So 
that's what we did. And I, I appreciate the explanation. What was what was the response rate at this at this point? It is, the survey has only been partially analyzed, so I don't have all the final. We can share that with you later. But as Sarah shared in her report out, it did differ between, at least so far in what we've analyzed, it differed between independent primary care providers and those who are employed. And I think you can probably figure out why. Yes, um, but what, was the, what were the rates? I, I don't have those off the top of my head. The rates of, of response or the rates of like versus not like, et cetera. We the, can the, hear the, that the, later. Yep, yeah, the response rates would be great. Um, mm -hmm. if you must know like how many you sent out and how many you got back. Oh, oh even yeah. I don't know the total we sent out, but as, as we said, we got 80 completed and a few more partially completed. So I believe there are about 80 being analyzed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess uh, what I what I'd like to to be able to do looking at the budget is to to move beyond a simple assessment of the dollars. Healthcare is expensive. Um, if we were in our country, we were getting um, we all felt confident that we were getting great service. Our lives were healthier. We were living longer because of the health care we were receiving. We'd probably be pretty happy spending a lot on health care. And we spend tens of billions of dollars a year on pet food, right? We don't, we're a pretty wealthy country overall. We, that, that seems a reasonable place to spend money is on health care. But in our healthcare system, as you all know, and you're probably motivated to do what you do because you know some of this information, our outcomes are mediocre at best, but we spend more than twice as much per citizen as any other country. And so we need to move beyond just the dollar amount to look at the outcomes that the work we're doing is producing. And, and six years in, right, I'd like to be able to look at a, a budget for an organization and see here's where we were when we started. Here are the things that we've been doing. Here's where we are now. Here's what we're going to do next. And none of those numbers are ever going to be perfect. There, there's going to be limitations and problems with all of them each of the time. And we can have a discussion about that. But we want to be able to see what's happening because of all that's being spent. And that's very difficult to see with the material that you're providing to us. I, I want you to succeed. I want healthcare transformation. But we, I need to see more of it, right? Like, what are, here are the outcomes that matter. Here are our priorities. Here's our impact. Here's what we've been doing to address the systematic issues facing the state's healthcare system. And these things can be rather simple when you break it down. We, you, we could be asking, right, what proportion of covered lives of patients have diabetes? What proportion of the patients with diabetes have an A1C level greater than nine? That's already being done. Right, you've got those numbers. The next step is to say what proportion of those patients have not been seen in the last six months? Of the patients who have not been seen, what number of those end up in the ED or end up admitted? Over time, for any organ for the whole care system and for any HSA within it. The goal would be zero admissions and zero ED visits. And the number of patients with an A1C level greater than nine should shrink. You don't need to benchmark to anybody else. Just show that those numbers are declining and getting closer to zero. We need some type of, of measurement like that. A final question, this came up from listening um, today, Sarah, um, 
I didn't quite get it all, so I'm hoping that you'll you'll help me out. It says um, one cares unique. It's a statewide entity. Most other ACOs, I think she said, are more clinically integrated. How, yeah. How so, do... Tom, the point I was trying to make is that um, when you look around the country, ACOs vary tremendously in size. Many of them are aligned with a specific health system and work within that health system. So there's much more interoperability of data and information. And the point I was trying to make is that one of the ways One Care is complex is that we have this statewide network, lots of different organization types. They all have their own EHRs. They you know, define things differently, they calculate them differently, they have their own governance boards that they're all accountable to. So the layers of complexity and therefore sometimes the slowness of bringing people along and effectuating the type of change that we all wanna see, uh, I guess takes more time. And that's what I was trying to get at. Right. Yeah, and, and some, of, some of the data regarding successful ACOs across the country, right, that, that fits with those. Um, they tend to be smaller. They tend to be physician led, right? And so I'm wondering if, I know this would be a difficult question for any of you to answer on, on the spot. And so I'm not gonna ask anybody for an answer, but I'm left to wonder, would Vermonters be better served with more smaller physician led ACOs? And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, and uh, the last board member uh, with questions would, and certainly far from least, is Ms. Lunge. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Owen. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I had a couple of questions about the CPR program development um, that you spoke to briefly earlier in the hearing um, and in your materials. So specifically, um, your materials mentioned, and in response to the staff questions, you mentioned that you're exploring how to expand the CPR program to hospital-employed primary care and FQHCs. So could you give a, a bit more detailed status update on where that initiative is at um, and sort of your timetable of, of how you would see that developing? Sure thing. Um, so for FQHCs, we did a pretty deep dive with them um, actually it was leading up to last year's budget process and um, it sounded like timing wasn't quite right for the FQHC group and they, they didn't have to take it up. I think it would be relatively easy to apply over FQHCs. Some adjustments would be necessary because they're paid a little bit differently than independent primary care, but I think the concept would actually hold true quite nicely. Um, so if FQHCs are uh, willing to be a participant or a pilot site, we, I'd take it up in a, in a heartbeat. For hospital employed, one of the challenges that we ran into with this was the way uh, that uh, primary care billing happens within a hospital, and they have a separation of facility charges from the professional charges that just makes capturing the actual primary care claims much more challenging. It's even different between critical access hospitals, PPS hospitals. I don't think it's insurmountable, but I do think that we needed to do a little bit more diligence in terms of understanding those dynamics uh, to get it right. And I, I think what I'd like to do during 2023 is some sort of a conceptual or shadow year with a few hospital employed sites, because I, I think it would be great to really incorporate hospital employed CPR uh, sites um, into our array. Thanks. Sorry, I'm gonna it's gonna take me a minute to get to my questions. They're embedded in my binder. So um, we have had quite a bit of discussion about the commercial ACO programs and uh, movement there in terms of uh, what I will call a misalignment of priorities between the provider network and the commercial payers. Uh, I'm wondering if you have ideas or thoughts around how to build um, alignment uh, as a state, not necessarily just for one care, but as a state. Good question. I think it's really getting 
every component of the state, the providers, insurance companies, et cetera, on the same uh, page in terms of what we're trying to achieve collectively. And I, I actually, even though we haven't really um, succeeded yet in getting these unreconciled fixed payment with commercial insurers, there's more universal interest in doing it, which I think is really good. And now it's more in the space of let's figure out the details of it. And that's where we've been hung up a little bit. And um, so I think there's some positive movement uh, in this space, and we intend to keep working uh, with with both of our contracted and commercial insurers to try and figure this out for next year. We even talked about maybe if there's an, a mid-year arrangement that um, we could uh, think about rolling out during 2023. So I think there's positive movement, but we really had to get target models ironed out with them. And then I think we do need to spend some time collectively on shared purpose, shared value of having fixed payment arrangements for providers. Thanks. So I wanted to ask you a little bit for more discussion about the blueprint um, for health and particularly around your new standard reports. Um, I may be out of date on what the blueprint is doing, but they used to do standard reports to practices that was discontinued. And I think now their standard reports are annual. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your standard reports and how they either complement um, or uh, not <laughs> the blueprint for health data analytics that are provided, since one of the statutory criteria is ensuring that there's not duplication between the ACO and the blueprint for health. I'm happy to start with that question. Um, the the blueprint reports, as you mentioned, have evolved over time, as has one cares. So you know, lots of movement, which I think is both um, very positive because it's responding to the requests and the needs of the network, but can also cause confusion, right? As documents are changing and and you know, people need to know who to expect it from and when. So uh, as we testified about last year um, and have since implemented, we've really been focused on some new reports related to our quality uh, measurement, so our VBIF reporting and our primary care panel management reporting, getting those out into the field in a timely manner to inform kind of current performance and, and incentivize the, the behavior change we want to see. Um, I think where we still have opportunities is that OneCare is a contracted network. We have the ability to share data within that network. And where there is alignment and overlap uh, in a good way with the blueprint, it makes it much easier. So for example, if a community health team administrative entity is a hospital and that hospital's in our network, and there's a mutuality to the purpose of seeing the data, that makes it easier to translate that information and use it for multiple purposes. Where there are distinctions, um, that creates some challenges, and we have not been able to independently solve those yet, although we keep working on it and, and trying to evolve within the limits of our data use agreements. So in that sense, I feel like uh, what we're seeing in the community level is more timely information. Uh, certainly the HSA consults that Dr. Wolfman's described and has been evolving are a really key uh, central location for dissemination of particularly actionable information. So what are we seeing in your community that is different, worse potentially than somewhere else, and what, what can you do about it? And then we're supplementing that in some new ways with uh, coaching between those sessions to really say, okay, you committed to do A, B, and C. What progress have you made in that arena? And uh, what we're trying to do is really make sure that we're doing that in a complementary fashion with the blueprint, with the priorities that are already established on the ground, that we're trying not to kind of come in on top of those. And I think that's more and more vital as we're all talking about workforce challenges, right, and, and the need for reducing burden and better coordination. One of the recognitions that we've had and what we've tried to leverage in our partnership with the blueprint is really around the quality improvement support. So the blueprint has quite a number of quality improvement facilitators deployed throughout the state. OneCare has two, one in kind of focused in the north and one in the south to work collaboratively through that process, not duplicatively. So those are some of the tangible things that I've been seeing. Um, I'd have to get back to you if you have more specific questions about specific data reports. 
No, thanks. I just wanted to get a sense of how that was going, because quite frankly, the lack of blueprint data, I think, has been uh, a problem um, in general for the primary care medical homes. Um, in terms of the benchmark report, um, I'll just make a comment that I would, when you have developed your uh, more in-depth analysis and key takeaways from that report, I'd be very interested in learning more about that. Um, it Some of the data was not intuitive to me that certain things were high and other things were low um, in terms of utilization versus cost. So having a deeper understanding of what's behind that would, I think, be very interesting and helpful um, in general. We had some of the same observations, which is why we're digging in. Yeah, great. Um, in terms of uh, Dulce, uh, in your submission, you mentioned that uh, One Care is declining its contribution, and the Department of Health, I think, is replacing that. Could you speak a little bit more about how that came about and th the driving forces behind there? Sure. Um, we're really implementing a planned uh, kind of progression that has been negotiated and in place for a couple of years now. And uh, it came about really because uh, One Care, when we first started the Dulce program, it was kind of when we were in a phase and a mindset around short term investments in innovative ideas that needed to be sustained uh, by you know, local community and providers. And so that was the initial uh, approach. We certainly learned through Dulce that they had some great outcomes and that uh, the system's fairly complex. So meaning I think I spoke to this a little bit earlier. It's not just something that you could cookie cut or move into all settings of care. And yet everybody believes that it's something that has value in those communities it's serving. So we started some conversations now a couple of years ago with the director of maternal child health at the health department and really explored how that aligns with the MCH goals of the Title V grant and then what we could envision for a longer term. And so with that last year, we stepped down uh, the first phase and then this year or for 2023, we plan to do that again. Um, but all of that said, I think you know, par in parallel, we continue to learn more and continue to engage around our SDOH data to really think about the, the overarching system of care and what are some of the opportunities that one care can best influence. Thanks. Um, so it's the long term goal then that Dulce funding would essentially move to the to VDH at some point, or would you consider that to continue to be a collaborative venture? Right now, I think we consider it to be collaborative. We don't have a, a date aligned up with them that it goes to zero, um, but it's something that we do need to continue exploring. OK. Great. Um, I think actually the rest of my topics have been thoroughly explored, which is one of the benefits of going last. So I'm all set and I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I had two brief follow-ups based on my fellow board members' questions. Um, on the benchmarking uh, study, has there been any effort or will there be any effort to normalize Vermont's results for the fact that we are a low cost Medicare state, in fact, the lowest cost Medicare state in the country. So the data have already been normalized through risk adjustment and unit cost analysis. The concept that uh, one care is a low cost ACO relative to the others is foundational to the findings of the model. And so, no, there is not a plan to readjust those numbers. And I think as to Dr. Merman's point, you know, what we are trying to suss out is, is this because of the ACO and the ACO's work, or is this because Vermont is generally considered the healthiest state in the country and because we have severe wait times and access issues? I mean, obviously, if you can't get into the doctor at the volume you want, the costs are going to be lower, particularly if you're a healthy state. So I think ensuring that data reflects those macro demographics of the state would be particularly valuable for us to evaluate it. I think we can certainly look at some of those extra demographics that you're interested in. I would also just mention that 
contextually, there are a tremendous number of environmental factors that we should probably consider if we want to think that we're comparing apples to apples. So the amount of competition, the number of urgent care centers, you know, how many sniff beds per capita there are. There are lots and lots of factors out there, which is why I think ultimately this provides some interesting and helpful information to us to see you know, maybe where we are performing well and where we're performing significantly worse and perhaps should put some energy in, but ultimately the interventions that align with those areas of opportunity have to be thought about in the context of Vermont's healthcare resources and environment. Yeah, totally. I mean, most reports you re receive from an expert would have some sort of, you know, risk analysis based on the environmental factors for which you can't actually, you know, determine causation. So I think a good report would have that kind of information for us to consider how strongly we should be, you know, evaluating what, what what's in the report. Um, the only other question I had real quick um, is I think I think the CEO said something about um, the ACO provides data to enable providers to do things and that the ACO is a small part in helping them. And this isn't, you know, one care can't fix all of Vermont's problems with its health care challenges, right? Neither can the care board, neither can PCPs, neither can UVM. There's a huge universe of insurance companies that have to figure this out together. And from uh, that perspective, what I want to get a sense from your view is who is the most accountable? If you're to do a hierarchy, you have patients, you have PCPs, you have nurses, you have RNs, you have PAs, you have doctors, hospitals, ACOs. Who who should be accountable for results if you were to do a hierarchy? Who has the best opportunity to make an impact on what we're all trying to fix? And I want to pay that person. Yeah, I don't know if you're asking a question or making a statement, so I guess that would be helpful. What, Mike, it's, a, it's a question. What's your perspective on where we should be deploying our resources to the people that are most accountable for improving care and cost? I think it all starts um, at the state and federal levels um, in terms of policies and procedures um, and how payments are made to providers. I mean, that's at the top level. It's your governance for your state and federal government. But how, right, and I want your perspective from your work on where the federal government or the state government should be deploying its resources at the level that makes the most impact. Well, long-term, that's prevention. And so the money would be, if you want prevention, should be deployed, you know, obviously this is rough, but it should be deployed to the patients themselves and to their primary care providers? It could be. It also could be to the communities directly for providing things like, um, you know, sidewalks, infrastructure in the community, um, better benefits so everybody has food and housing security. Like it's all those upstream social determinants of health, yet um, we don't invest in them as a country because they don't have those annual return on investments that everybody is looking to be able to measure year over year. So until we as a country start looking at those upstream, really upstream variables, we won't be better off. That's, that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that that view. I, I, I that's helpful. Does anyone else have any views on this question? Okay. Great. Um, thank you all for for um, addressing the board's questions. We and the staff. So we really appreciate that. And with that, I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike Fisher here, uh, healthcare advocate. I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions and then Sam will have a few questions. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for spending um, spending the day together um, and providing a lot of uh, a lot of answers to a lot of questions. Um, getting to go last also, um, I think, shortens our questions 
uh, and maybe some of our questions become follow ups um, to discussions that have already happened. Um, let me start with a, a recognition of some positives. Uh, we, we um, you know, again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we, we really want to acknowledge and support OCB's uh, commitment to DEI work uh, within your governance structure and the development of a disparity scorecard. I think this is important work to step in the right direction. Um, we also want to recognize uh, or I want to recognize that uh, we had a we had a, a, a nice meeting with the uh, your patient and family advisory committee. Um, look forward to that every year. Um, you have indeed assembled a, a group of of consumers that have a lot of questions about how to make the world a better place. <clears throat> um, um, I want to uh, uh, in follow up maybe to Marissa's point about the contract, um, the contract between UVM and OneCare. Um, I, I, you know, I, I heard the question, I heard your answers. I know this is complicated stuff and it takes a while to develop. Um, I think I heard you say that it was signed up on uh, November 1st. Um, um, but I, I, I do want to express a uh, frustration that we don't have that in front of us today. Um, I think we should have that in front of us today. So just wanted to express that. Um, it would make it easier. It would help a great deal. Um, so um, I have a few questions about IT systems. Um, uh, we at the Healthcare Advocates Office are concerned about the amount of money that flows into healthcare IT systems. This concern is not just about One Care Vermont. This is a much broader concern, but because we have One Care in front of us today, there's a few examples. Um, so, um, um, with regard to Care Navigator, um, we asked a question about how much Care Navigator uh, has cost, um, and uh, you provided the answer uh, in your written uh, answer to us that in 2021 you spent $387,500 $387, on Care Navigator. Our question was, well, so I, I'm trying to back into how much was spent altogether on Care Navigator. Um, how many years was Care Navigator uh, invested in by OneCare? And is that 387,000 sum a good proxy for how much was spent per year? Mike, this is Sarah. Um, I don't know the, the number off the top of my head that was spent overall. Frankly, we'd have to pull lots and lots of accounting records to figure that out. But I do think that that number we provided you for 2021 is a very fair proxy for what the annualized expenses were for the system and the customizations that we were adding year after year to try to make this work for our provider network. So, and, and thank you. I'm not asking for a specific audited number by any means. I'm just, I'm asking for a sense of it. So, so would to get a proxy about how much was invested in Care Navigator, would we multiply that by six? Literally going to count on my hand here. So, yeah, six. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so, um, there have been quite a lot of questions about One Care's new contract with UVM. Um, and so, I want to um, try and fly uh, a little bit high on this, but. Um, we do have a few questions about it. Um, um, our non-UVM Health Network uh, um, One Care participation fees being used to fund the analytic work that One Care contracts with UVM Health Network for. Yeah. So, Mike, our model is that um, the hospital participants pay for our operational budget. So. Um, anything that the ACO supplies is universally purchased at differing rates. 
across hospital systems and you know the smaller hospitals with their net patient revenue obviously pay less than than the larger hospitals too but they paid that before um this isn't a new cost to them in fact um this is the same cost to them as it was in the past and we're looking to get a better analytics tool out of this in the future. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the firewalls, the data firewalls. I'm not gonna ask that question again. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the, the high level description that you provided, um, but I think we're all interested, or the Healthcare Advocates Office is interested in the, in, in, a, in a much more detail um, about the separation of about the firewall. Um, but about what you just spoke to, Vicky, um, um, can you say a little bit about what motivated you to move away from Health Catalyst? Yeah, so as we worked through our strategic planning process, uh, it was unanimous that we needed to elevate our data and have access to better data analytics that wasn't so manual, right? That we weren't creating from our staff, right? Having to gather data to be able to push out answers um, for our provider network. Because remember, again, we have we don't just have one organization that we're trying to take in data for. We had about 170 organizations that we're trying to take in data for. And so at the same time, we were told by our board, we cannot raise dues. So we want a better enhanced system and we don't want to pay more for it. And because we, we can't pay more for it. And so at that point in time, UVM Health Network was exploring a population health um, tool, because remember, one care is just one value-based care arrangement that UVM Health Network has across its enterprise. So they were exploring some opportunities specific to value-based care contracts. And so our board said to us at that time, why don't you explore whether or not there is opportunities to work with UVM Health Network, use, as Sarah talked about previously, um, you know, how large they are as a system and the pricing that would be available to them to get a enhanced tool for the ACO that would better support our growing data and analytics needs within the same, um, you know, cost contract. Because as you've seen, our costs haven't gone up year over year. In fact, we've taken a precipitous decline in how much our operations costs are. Yet the accountabilities and the payment reforms that we have to manage and the provider network we have has been growing since we started. So we need some pretty sophisticated tools to be able to manage that tension. So for you know, today and for a number of years, OneCare has talked about its data and analytics as as one of its core functions. Um, and, and in fact, I think I think I've heard you say this is what you do well, and something you that you get to do that smaller hospitals really can't do for themselves. Um, I can't help but wonder whether I, I guess I end up with something of a similar question that I asked about Care Navigator, but now about Health Catalyst, um, there's something about what you were getting out of Cat Health Catalyst for, for however many years you've been working with them that wasn't sufficient to do the work that you thought was right. Um, and so, I, so, so I have the question about the money that's been expended and whether, uh, whether that was reasonable. Yeah, yeah I'll have to get the details, Sarah, but I would say, yes, it was reasonable. And remember, technology has advanced since we first purchased Health Catalyst. And so ACOs have come more mainstream. And then there's been data and analytic services that have grown around ACOs. 
right? So it's always good. You shouldn't just use the same vendor year over year. You should look for vendors that maybe are more specific to the work that you do as an as an ACO. But there are you you work through the process of the RFP. Probably have a more detailed description than I do. Yeah, I don't need to go into a tons of detail. I would just add that our current system is not broken. It's inefficient. And it requires a lot of manual staff work to maintain and manipulate that information. And it's in part because that particular vendor has chosen to focus on other priorities, not so much in the ACO population health analytics space to date. In contrast, this other vendor, Arcadia, built that up quite a bit over the last four or five years and now has standard reports that has the data organized in ways that can we think can be more efficient and effective over time. It is going to take us some time to realize that. So the focus that we've had is on making sure the costs are neutral, meaning that we don't duplicate payments as we're starting to transition those. And that ultimately, we think that there will be um, some greater efficiencies. We can't quantify them yet in the sense of like reduced staff effort to manually load data or to um, customize things to actually be able to use it. That will come over time. But I think we do have a pretty strong belief that it's going to be easier and better in terms of how we serve our network. So just to give you a really practical example, um, right now we have somebody who has to program some standard reports that we want to push out every month. And then we have to have a staff member manually load them to a secure place where then we have to notify providers to remember to go get them. In the new system, there will be security in place that will allow non-PHI contained data to be reported directly into the email box of people who are provisioned to have that level of access. So they'll get their summary report and then based on their user access, they'll be able to click on a link to go get more information to help them close care gaps, manage populations, et cetera. So that's just one example of where we want to be heading to keep up with technology and its evolution. Okay, just, just one more data question then. Um, um, whenever, whenever you do a transition to a different data system and you have to interface with existing data systems, there's hiccups, right? Um, do you expect there to be transition stresses for Vermont hospitals? around the transition to this new new data platform? Uh, the only stressor that I think is inevitable is the time it takes people to learn new reports. And obviously it's our job to help support that, but we are making sure that the reporting that they currently get will continue until the new reporting is ready and that it, people have had a chance to learn it and transition over. And that was a fundamental concept that our board kind of set out as a guardrail. Um, so yes, there will be bumps to your point. It's inevitable. I think, you know, one of the chronic bumps that we're always dealing with are, uh, data files that come in from payers that are not formatted correctly per the contract specs. And we'd have to go back and, you know, over and over again, have those conversations that's going to happen to a certain extent, regardless of the, the platform. Um, it's really about how we manage those things and how we continue to work on improving them. Um, all right, I'll, I'll leave this topic of data systems with a statement that from the healthcare advocates perspective, we have a serious concern about how much money, uh, how much healthcare dollars go into data systems and continue to wonder whether we're not in any way opposed to data and analytics, but continue to wonder about, um, about just how much money flows into them and have concerns. Um, so with respect to Medicare and the increased population of people, the, the uptick in Medicare Advantage, um, it was, uh, we, we, we read in your, uh, in your budget narrative, uh, sort of that dynamic of the number of, uh, the increased number of people moving into Advantage and its impact on you. Um, we also noted in your answer to, I think it was a board question, a recognition that uh, I think you said one care data suggests that the population leaving traditional Medicare for Medicare Advantage has lower costs on average. Um, FYI, uh, that is a very similar finding to uh, a description in a 
large insurers um, uh, Medigap filing uh, that the population moving to Medicare Advantage have has a lower morbidity. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this leads to the question, and I know that we've asked this question before, but we continue to wonder from one care's perspective um, whether the uptick, whether this movement, this movement of relatively healthier lives out of traditional Medicare and therefore out of your attribution um, is a good thing or a bad thing for the for the all payer effort uh, and for one cares goals. I think you kind of have to separate that a little bit because um, I always hate to there's the all payer model which the you know the state is the signatories to and they have very specific goals and accountabilities under that. Um, and then there's the ACOs. Currently, OneCare is the only ACO that has agreed to participate in the state's APM reform. Um, and I would say we need to look to the next agreement. I don't think this is something um, that OneCare has the bandwidth to look at the Medicare Advantage over the next two years as we transition out of this current all payer model agreement into whatever comes next, but it has to become part of our strategy at the ACO level to look at what programs make sense for us to be in, not necessarily what programs fit the state's goals and responsibilities for scale targets, if there are even scale targets that come into play in the next all payer model agreement. Um, I, I apologize. I, I, I did not manage to say one uh, one thing in my original question that I just think is important to say out loud, um, sort of in recognition of full transparency here. Um, OCV as a part of UVM is part of an entity that's offering a um, a Medicare Advantage plan, and I just think it's important to recognize that. Um, I, and I also appreciate that uh, uh, it's not within your bandwidth um, overall, and maybe not at 3:42 after a long day to to think about. Um, but um, but I think it's something. It is, it is indeed something affecting the Vermont landscape, and I think also affecting one care. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sam to ask a few questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the HCA. Um, I want to turn to page 18 of the narrative where uh, you talked about the effectiveness of population health management activities will be assessed, and you, and I quote, over the next three to five years. I want to ask you to consider this from the perspective of a Vermont family that makes a typical median income that has a $15,000 deductible with real health care needs in their family and how you justify this to them. I think as we've talked before, Sam, and been recognized by this committee, um, affordability is not um, just the accountability of One Care Vermont. We have a small section of the population. We are but one cog in the wheel. And yes, there are other tools that can have more immediate effects. We're charged with population health management, quality, and total cost of care. And so I totally hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree with you. In fact, I, I agree with you, but I think that you have to look to the system and the other entities on how you make some more immediate changes. Okay, um, thank you for that. I mean, I this goes into our next question, which is over the over the, in the past we've heard you talk a lot about bending the cost curve and even reducing the per, tap, per capita cost of care, and it's notable that this seems to have been significantly downplayed and discussion of it really arose mostly upon questioning from Chair Foster today. Um, 
And we heard that OneCare performs better compared to national benchmarks on reducing costs. But I want to point out that these benchmarks don't require these costs to decrease, and they only refer to system costs, not public costs, borne by people, like Vermonters like all of us. Um, do Vermonters receive any of these shared savings from these models, or does it all simply flow to participating providers? Or are there any plans for these savings to flow to Vermonters in the future? It, it all flows to participating pro, uh, providers. That's the ACO model and the way that it's uh, set up. There are additional incentives that can be provided to patients that are part of the ACO. And I think um, those do occur um, because you're allowed to provide incentives that you otherwise wouldn't as being part of an ACO that don't look at anti stark and kickback rules and things of that nature. So there are certainly benefits that are accruing um, to individuals that are part of the ACO, but it's not through shared savings. I, I can add a little bit to that. Um, for the commercial programs where there's the most direct linkage between a, a patient's payment and the insurance coverage, what um, we have actually seen in the past is that if One Care of Vermont owes a shared losses payment, for example, back to the insurer, that that payment back to the insurer becomes part of their rate filing for the next year. So in other words, it offsets some of the increase that you'd expect in the following year. So I was very glad when I saw that that actually occurred, and I would think that's an, an important thing, that an important dynamic um, in place with these commercial arrangements. Thank you for that. That's that's helpful. Um, I know some of the questions today have focused a bit on evaluating causal impact. Um, so this is in that realm. Um, in your uh, in responses to our questions, you wrote, due to the complex healthcare reform landscape, one care does not maintain a goal of determining definitive causality of its programs. And I think we've heard today that you know the health system is complex. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but so I but I want to point out that this doesn't necessarily mean that causal analysis in this area is impossible or that it hasn't been done already or there aren't methods to do this. I mean, I think we can point to directly acyclic graphs, grade methodology, difference and difference, which NORC used, among others. So I'm wondering why none of these methods appear to have been utilized by one care in the past, or if there's a plan to use these methods in the future to evaluate the impact of these taxpayer funded approaches to population health. Sam, thanks for the question. I think the future is unknown, but we're hoping that through hiring this particular new FTE that we'll be able to have some guidance to help us in that arena. Uh, speaking to the past and kind of the present, we have a, a fantastic group of analysts who are really focused on understanding claims data and clinical data and being able to turn that around into actionable insights for on the ground performance. We did not hire them you know, at the various points in time to be able to do some of those particular types of analyses. Um, that's not to say that we can't you know, advance or change things in the future, but we've really been focused on trying to ingest all of this complex information, make sense of it, and get it out to folks. We have, uh, I think, more to do as we've tested various methods, frankly, to um, mixed results in terms of what methodology makes the most sense to evaluate specific programs or even, uh, you know, long-term investments. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, just a, a follow-up, a bit of a comment on the causality piece, not to harp on it too much, but one one concern that we wanted to raise is one of the guiding questions for the KPI key performance indicator work um, that member Walsh asked questions about that I think we're all keen to learn more about was what metrics best demonstrate value or potential value of one care. And this I think strikes as very clearly as a leading question that presupposes the existence of something that should be asked. So I just want to make that point in the hope that future causal work proceeds from more of a null hypothesis um, style question. Um, but our last question um, on page 23 of the narrative, it reads, from the healthcare provider side, commitment to payment reform remains strong, 
but their concerns related to the magnitude of hospital commercial rate charge requests. Ensuring that approved hospital commercial rate charges are incorporated in the fixed payment amounts is essential for sustainability. I'm wondering how OneCare reconciles these. It appears to be conflicting messages, very high, large commercial charge requests, and then hospital claims that these charges are needed for sustainability. Yeah, good question there. Um, so what I was conveying in that um, uh, clause there was that every provider accepting a fixed payment will view fee for service as a reference point, whether we like it or not. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's detrimental. Um, so to make sure that these payment reforms are effective and sustainable, we do need to make sure that their approved rate increases are incorporated. Otherwise, you know, any hospital with this being a voluntary model would just say, wait a second, I can do a lot better in fee for service. So making sure that there's a connection point there is very important. And at the same time, this is attention is not putting too much weight on variation from fee for service, I think is something that will make pay true payment reform more uh, sustainable over time. Thank you, appreciate it. Turn back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you for those excellent questions from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Um, I appreciate that and the responses. Um, it is 3.51 and we still have uh, public comment, a little board business. Cassidy, uh, how are you holding up? I'm doing really well. If I could just ask quickly, uh, Mr. Prish, what did you just say there? Um, you said the cycling pass methods at the end you were talking about um, that uh, NARC uses? Oh, um, yeah, so there's, so NORC, uh, I can't actually remember the acronym, but I can look it up. Um, but it's difference in difference, I believe is what I was talking about. What, what did you say exactly? You used two different, it sounded like nouns um, for two different methods. Sure, there's directly acyclic graphs, which I believe I mentioned, um, and sufficient component cause model, and then difference in difference modeling. Um, Okay, perfect. That's all I needed. Um, yes, I will need to recall my backup recorder at about 5.15 today, uh, Mr. Foster, but other than that, I'm doing great. All right. Well, um, I certainly hope to wrap it up before then. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to public comment. And for public comment, um, please use the raise your hand function, and I'll endeavor to call on folks in the order in which their hands are raised. Uh, is there any public comment? Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me let me take a pause. I, I actually need five minutes because I think I might have a technical problem with seeing there's a lot of people. Why don't we go off the record and we can just come back at 358 and and I apologize. Thank you. Off the record.
Um, okay, uh, we're, we're back on the record. Um, uh, I, I had one more that I forgot to ask. And I apologize for chiming in with one more. Um, I'm looking at, um, it's tab W in the binder, appendix 6.1 balance sheet. And there's a line that says, due to UVM MC, 2022, 4.25, 2023, 3.797. I just wanted to understand what that was. Sure, I can take that one. So uh, you mentioned before that we're all UVM Medical Center employees. So this particular line um, is the way in which we reimburse, one care reimburses UVM Medical Center for the salary expense and any other uh, expenses that UVM pays on our behalf. So. For example, when um, UVM cuts payroll for all the staff, we then pay UVM back through this two to do from account. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt the flow, and with that, I'll turn it to public comment. I think I've got this figured out. If you can, if you're on the phone, please identify yourself. The first hand is Ham Davis. Uh, please go ahead, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just gonna. Uh, couple of comments on this. Um, I've been to these meetings, started going to this type of meeting in 1983, and this, this is the most unusual one I've seen over that whole period. Uh, it's, it, I'm struck by what looks to me like a huge air of unreality that hangs over the whole thing. One Care Vermont is assumed to be the per, the, the agency that's supposed to, con to, uh, to control costs in the system. That is impossible. They have no power to do that, no power whatsoever. What they can do is, and what they do do is, is they can give you a fixed price contract, which is the way you get the capitation, which is the way the federal government and the health policy industry understand as a way to get the real cost containment. They can't, the, the people that can, the people that have the power to actually change costs is a Green Mountain Care Board itself. They've got, for, for the last year, they've had in their website all kinds of data about problems uh, that with, with, especially with the non-network system, the non-health, Vermont Health, M the, uh, the non-UVM network segment of the, of, the, uh, of the system. The costs in the, in, U in the UVM system on a cost per capita basis are the lowest and the quality, quality is lower, is better than the rest of the system by a factor of two or three. And so what I'm curious, and, and this, the, the uh, we've just gone through the board, not under this particular chairman, but just went through the whole budget cycle and not one single element of all that data that's been sitting there for a year was even mentioned. So I, I just don't get it. I mean, the reality is One Care Vermont, One Care Vermont can, can get you know, about $35 million a year to each of the 700 or so primary care doctors in the state. They will deliver, they can, they can construct a contract, a fixed price contract with any pair who's willing to do it, but they have no power, none whatsoever, to actually force any payer to do that. The only people that have power in this system are the board itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Davis, for your for your insights and your comment, and uh, for participating in meetings like this um, for such a long duration. It's really important, and thank you. Uh, is there any other uh, public comment? I see uh, no other public comment, uh, which means I had anticipated there would be much. And like a lot of my experience in this job, I'm pretty bad at uh, anticipating what happens and what will, what will come forward next. Um, so with that, uh, I do wanna thank the One Care team. You guys were incredibly patient and thoughtful in your responses to uh, a wide variety and assortment of questions. Um, I thought you did a really nice job of being candid, and uh, I appreciate that and recognize it. So thank you for doing that. I think it informs the board a lot more of where we are and how we can help. And hopefully it was a valuable process for you all as well. Um, your presentation, I'm sure, took immense time and effort to, to put together. 
and had a lot of detail in the binder was very helpful for me. So I want to recognize that effort that you all put in and thank you for it. Um, and internally, um, I don't think people recognize the amount of work the staff does to get the board ready and under explain all of this to us. Um, I can tell you there's a lot of late nights by a lot of staff members, um, a lot of it because of me and others. But I want to thank them publicly and acknowledge the kind of effort and work they put into this. It's really, really, really impressive. Um, so thank you, staff. Um, and with that, I think we can conclude uh, the one care portion of today's um, meeting. And, and thank you all. Um, is there any uh, old business to come before the board? Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And it sounds like there's none opposed. And so the motion carries. Uh, thank you all, and the meeting is adjourned. And thank you, Cassidy. Have a good night.